Hello. Thanks for tuning in. All right, I'm gonna talk in a moment and give some context for my conversation with Greg, which is really just awesome. Um, for some housekeeping. So uh, links below for the Circling Institute in all of our courses, we have a uh, online Art of Circling training course open for registration. And we have, uh, I think it's July 11th and 12th, a weekend coming up all online. So, and we have a Thursday night event that we do online as well, which is um, a drop-in event. All that information is below. If you're interested in working with me one-on-one, -on -one, um, just go ahead and email me. My email is below as well. All right. So Greg actually contacted me after, um, after our conversation, my last conversation with John Verveke and about, about a notion of, of where we, in John, in John and I's conversation talking about one of the central part of his tree of life, his theory is the justification, um, hypothesis basically of, 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 and we go deep into this, but I was wanting to bring that into the conversation with John and we talked about moving, moving in our conversations from a, the courtroom to the, the, um, the courtyard. Uh, and so John, and so he just basically wrote me and said, let's talk, right? So what a great guy. Um, brilliant mind, radical thinker, thinking so deeply about things, basically revealed a unified field theory of psychology, which is, if you know anything about psychology, you know that it kind of reinvents the wheel every time, right? So he, he really got underneath there and showed basically a very a deep unity or a way to look at things that shows how they one system involves into the next. It has complexity theory in there, as psychodynamics, it has sociology. I mean, it's, it's, it's really comprehensive um, and quite innovative. And so in the conversation, we go deep into that system and we, we talk a lot about circling and the primacy of inner subjectivity and what happens there and when it goes wrong, what happens to us and when it goes right, what happens to us. And it was really great talking about circling and, and, and then him bringing it in terms of his system was really enlightening for me. It was really great. But also kind of just revealing how, I think the thing I got about this is how personal, like it really is for him, his ideas and how risky that is to allow something to, when something like an idea, like an insight that's a deep mystery, um, to bring that into the world, how personal that is, right? And so we talk a lot about that. And I just really get this sense of um, the deep place of love that this all comes from with him and reveals. and. Uh, so I really enjoyed getting to know him and I look to have him on again and happy that he's part of the conversation. All right. Much love. Bye-bye. Hello, Greg. Hey, guy. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to my screen. Welcome to the channel. Um, welcome to the universe if you haven't been officially welcomed yet. It's the one place well, for both uh, the guest and the host. <laughs> Fantastic, man. It's wonderful <laughs> to be here. Uh, your screen's a beautiful place. I already feel the warmth. <laughs> All right. On. Good to, it's good to see you. And it's been good to see, as I was talking about before, and I want to give you a chance just to kind of talk, talk a bit about your work so people who are unfamiliar with it have, can, can get a, a little bit of a handle on some of the terms and stuff that we're using as we go, go through some of it. But um, the, one, the one thing I notice I'm... I'm I mean, I'm just really impressed with, with your tree of knowledge and the whole system that you come from, right? And in psychology and how you bridge so many different things, ontology, epistemology, all that, that really I know in, in what I understand is the attempt to kind of bring unity or realize unity in a field of psychology, which is like, where um, you know a psychoanalytic system will reinvent the whole wheel, kind of every time, right? It, I mean, it's just known for that, right? So, that's right. 
So I know that uh, it's, a, so psychology as a science is, um, is just as riddle has traditionally been riddled with like a lot of ambiguity, right? Huge, um, absolutely. Which, which, so just the fact that like in a very real way, you were able to um, realize a kind of a, a way of unifying it that, that, that in my, in my view really didn't, didn't level down to use the Heideggerian term, like didn't level mm -hmm. down, right. Any of the particulars, but actually exemplified, right. Why it showed up like that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, so that's just, just the mind that, that's, that thinks in that way. I just have just really mm -hmm. been impressed by and appreciate a lot. Oh, well, yeah. I feel known. Uh, I appreciate that, that uh, intro and frame. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, I didn't, it's a, in retrospect, it's one of those things you look back on, you're like, gosh, I can't believe I didn't know that. And so now I try to tell everybody, so at least about the, the what I now call, and I'm trying to popularize, the problem of psychology. Yeah, okay? yeah. Uh, which I really, I wish we better understood because I believe, and obviously my life's taken me to this, so I'm, I'm biased this way, but I really believe it's an unbelievably important mystery for us all to be aware of. Okay? Yeah. And, and it's pretty straightforward. And basically modern science, you know, gets its legs and from Galileo into Newton. Um, right. And it's really established in the 17th, 18th century. Uh, and then we decide, hey, we should apply this to... <laughs> human experience, basically, and, you know, in terms of there was called psychophysics, and then Wilhelm Wundt, um, and then they, so they, we're going to try to do a modern science analysis. In other words, I'm going to use the language system, and the methodology, the ontological epistemology, not necessarily talking those, but just, hey, how do we apply modern science to this thing we ever, we call psychology? Okay, it seemed like it made sense, um, but what happened from 19, 18, you know, if we go back a little bit to 1850, to by certainly 1930, um, while this field's trying to get its legs, what happens is emerges the problem of psychology. Mm. Really, Lev Vygotsky nailed, he called it the crisis, okay, back in 1920. Um, so what is it? Well, I, I like to enter it by saying, okay, physics, what's that? Well, physics is the science of matter and energy on the grid of space and time, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, and my energy, matter, their interactions, everybody, okay. What's chemistry? All right, science of the atomic elements and their behavior in a molecular form. What's biology? That's just science of life. What is psychology? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, well, it's yeah. behavior and mental process, okay? Yeah. But, and I, I bought that line. I, I thought that, that oh, okay, I, I think I know what that is. Mm -hmm. And then, you, and then you realize when you actually know how to look for it. What they then say, all the textbooks right away, they say, well, what we really do is we apply the scientific method uh, rather than folk psychology or subjective opinion. What makes psychology unique is the scientific method yeah. about behavior and mental process. Yeah. Okay, but then you go back and, well, what do you mean by behavior and mental process? And then no one, there's no consensus. So the oh. psychoanalytic people, and, and the psychophysical into introspection structuralist people and the William James functionalists and, right. and the John Watson behaviorists and then later the neo-behaviorists and the cognitivists, they all have different conceptions. Yeah. What the center of the discipline is. And that's amazing. Right. Amazing. Because that's not the case in biology. People have criticized me or said, well, wait a minute, we don't know what life is in biology, okay? Right. It's like, you don't know what the edges of life is. Okay? Yeah. Is the coronavirus alive when it sits there on the desk? Yeah. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Well, we don't have any doubt whether there are plants alive and why it's so different. And that biology is the science of life broadly defined. Yeah. Okay? So, the, so the biologists have the center. Psychologists have no center. Yeah. Yeah. Why, would, why don't we have a center? Right. You know? Right. Well, I, actually, you, you, you described yeah. some of the questions I've asked about my own life. Well, <laughs> guy, well, 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 actually, <laughs> well, actually, guy. I a <laughs> so actually, that's yeah, funny, but it's actually right. You know, I, mean, yeah. I loved your conversation with John and I heard John's awakening to the meaning crisis. I yeah. fall in love with him, you know? Yeah. And, and your question right there is exactly what my whole point is, is that actually, 
the modern scientific enterprise, which came dominant and displaced yeah. the, the religions before, which actually, yeah. though they didn't have the right logos in some ways, they had a lot more to say about our meaning of our lives. Yeah, yeah. And then so science cuts a lot of the legs out from under that. Right. And breaks down its psychology. Right. It's not accidental that we have an acute modern meaning crisis. Like yeah. what do you do in my life? other than just getting money and eating fun things and having sex and being self-interested until I die. Right. It's like, well, that's capitalism for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're, you're a physical entity and you know, you're self-interested based on evolution and you're yeah. just, so go out and do that. It's yeah. like, Oh my God, that doesn't yeah. fill the soul or the spirit, you know, right. it doesn't us. and indeed I, I think it's fundamentally wrong. Yeah. Um, and, and so, so, I think that's connected. I, I think the absence of right. psychology at the science deeply connects to our philosophy of our psychologies, of our societies, of what we're trying to do. Yeah. So, so it's like kind of, there's a sense in which I just, you know, as you were talking about this, you know, I, when I think about the scientific me method, it seems to, like its core method is to bracket out everything that is basically subjective. Or psychological, right? right? Mm -hmm. So just like, yeah. And so, yeah. how do you deal with these phenomena uh, called mind that don't are connected to right to a sub like a substance? Yeah, I could see a kind of a crisis out of it. Yet having a as a field a pressure to be scientific, yet a phenomena that won't reveal itself just in that way, right? Exactly. Exactly. And then that, yeah, exactly. That's that's exactly where, in fact. Um, so what Watson does is he takes strictly the scientific method. Yeah. And he says, well, if I'm going to use this as my lens, consciousness is gone. Right. Right. That's what he does. And then there's the arguments about what all that is. And we right. never got uh, the right descriptive framework for what we mean by the term mind. That's what, right. and, and that's what the tree of knowledge teaches you is it gives you a new vocabulary for talking about this concept mind. Right. And it, and it changes our, some of our definitions. So for example, if you know the shape of it, it goes from matter, uh -huh. so upside down cone of matter, yep. into life, and then into mind, and then into culture. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Now, I, I'm, and by each one of those, at least when we're talking with the language game and the tree of knowledge, each one of those are capitalized so that you know pro there's a proper conceptual definition and reference point. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So mind on the tree of knowledge yeah. to the third dimension of behavioral complexity, yeah. okay, which is the animal mental dimension of complexity. Right. right. Okay? And what that means is the argument is that animals are playing the game of existence yeah. okay, at a subordinate uh, of a superordinate level relative to plants and cells, yeah. which are playing a game of existence at a superordinate level relative to chemistry and atoms. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it, and the first thing we want to do is get that landscape, right. Which I actually call capital M mind. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this is going to actually address a key problem of the observation issue. So there's uh -huh. a issue of what are we actually observing and what is our language referring to? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I've got fish right over here in a fish tank. I don't can show you, but anyway, the fish are swimming around. Well, they're swimming around is mind. I'm looking, just, I wouldn't look out there and say that, oh, look at them living, which they are. Yeah. Look at them, that's mind. Yeah, yeah. Look at okay. them and look at their mental behavior. Right. I, right. As they swim around and I feed them and they go up and they eat, yeah. I'm watching mind just as you watch your plant grow, you're watching life. Yeah, right, right. So now I have a language that says, oh, I am now, a, I can be a scientist and say, I study mind defined as mental behavior. It gives me a behavioral definition of mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what it, but the behaviorists did is they just call it, they were so anti-mentalistic. They didn't realize that actually they weren't interested in behavior in general, like yeah. dropping the rock from a, you know, a, yeah. from a building. They're interested in a very unique kind of behavior, the behavior yeah. of animals as holes with complex bodies mediated by a brain. Right. Right. Totally. And that's a, that's what animals do, and that's what they do so crazy relative to plants or rocks. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. So it's and that so the adjective mental says, oh, that's the unique way in which mm -hmm. 
you know. So if you have a dead cat falls out of a tree, and a live cat will fall similarly, but the live cat lands on its feet and takes off, well, yeah. you factor out the gravity, and you say, well, the landing on the feet taken off, that's mental behavior. Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay? Yes, right. So that's a definition now of mind, not conscious, not phenomenological consciousness, but now we right. actually have the language of mind. Totally, totally, yeah. And we can actually have third person. Uh, right. One of the things that the system does is it helps figure out um, – because you're exactly right. This split, and you, have, you, I know you know some about integral theory. Uh huh. Yeah. And and this is Wilbur's totally right about this. So he's his quadrants show, you know, the hand sides, that right hand side, and it's that external, mm -hmm. exterior epistemology that you can yeah. take the camera. Yeah. Okay. And that's yeah. what science is. It's that observer measure that you can look at, and I can look at, and it's whatever the camera records. Right. 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 Can't take a camera of your inside. <laughs> you yes. Exactly. You know? So that's why it was always really complicated. But you yeah. can't take a camera of behavior. By, you know, the, how are we interacting right now? Yeah. So it's kind of like basically what I'm hearing is like mind. The picture I'm getting is everything that you described. Like there's this, th there's this sense where the movement that you see is somehow comported to beyond itself. Mm -hmm. Right. It, like it's, mm -hmm. it's extended in some way in responsive to what everything else or that's what's right. in its view. So just that's that right. sense of responsiveness, right? Absolutely. Wherever you see yep. that, that phenomena is right. mind, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and era, once you learn how to look for it, you see it really easy. It's, it's sensory, Aristotle called it the sensory motor animal level yeah. versus the vegetative level. They yeah. see, I just, I call it functional awareness and response. Yeah. Yeah. So you can observe somebody. You, you, we pay all attention to what other people are paying attention to and what they're, hey, you're not paying attention. <laughs> Exhibiting the functional awareness and response that we expect, right. right? Totally. From a third person perspective, we see it all the time. Right. Right. So I, I call it the I call it the excuse of why I'm in trouble. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It's why people try to control your attention and they see you're not paying them attention. So they you know. Exactly. The start of all my my trauma. <laughs> right. Well, so that's probably the need key. for the rest yeah. of the tree, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to get on to what should we pay attention to, right? And how to record attention yeah. we pay. You know, John would appreciate that from a rele relevance realization view. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah. Yeah, so, so the argument is, is that the base here of mind is this yeah. cognitive functional process. Yeah. So oh, cognitive revolutions, like, oh, we have information processing. You know, no, the nervous system is that. Yeah. Okay. And then you have the base, what I call mind one, is this neurocognitive functionalist view. Okay? And then what you were getting at was what I call mind two. Mind two is subjective phenomenology. Right, right. Okay? And that's, that's across the epistemological, what I call the epistemological gap. That's the Wilbur interior exterior problem. Right, right. Okay? And why the scientific approach to consciousness is really, uh, that level of that kind of consciousness is very difficult. Because yeah. You can't look at it with a camera. Yeah, yeah. You can experience it from the witnessing function of your own perspective. Right, right. And the, and and so that's like that's that's after that's it sits above mind. Well, that's part of the mental dimension. The argument is we get a brain, and we actually don't know, but somewhere along the animal kingdom brain level, mm -hmm. maybe into bees and insects. I don't know. We don't really know. Um, but certainly by the time you're at a rat. Okay, and a bird. Yeah. Okay, yeah. maybe my fish and vertebrates. There yeah. was f ten years ago. There was a whole special issue. Do what you know? What kind of pain, if any, do fish feel? And then right. they had all these experts on consciousness. And needless to say, it was a very complicated question. Interesting arguments on both sides that said, uh, you know, no, they're basically robots. Uh, to yes, they definitely feel pain. Uh, yeah. And at least at the Journal of Fisheries in 2009 or whenever the special issue was. Yeah. I read them and I was like, I think they feel pain, but do I right. know and do we know? Not really. Yeah. And far, does it, does it go down to a worm feeling pain? No, we're not really. We don't have a good understanding of mind too, okay? Yeah. Yet in the emergence. We know, so I think that it comes, you know, and I love John's system. We're going to be talking about this. I yeah. think there are these uh, electromagnetic waves that become the root of qualia, of adjectival qualia, and then what happens on that is a witnessing function that emerges with a brain, oh. uh, probably in the, in the, the what, what John calls a, adverbial qualia. 
Um, yeah. That's an organizing system. And I think certainly my fish have a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. That's where I think. But we don't know. Right. So we have to go down through humans yeah. to that because humans have mind three. Yeah. So mind three is the jump from mind into culture, and that's right. language and yeah. conscious justification. And the justification hypothesis and justification systems theory is a theory of human mind three. Right. Because right. okay. so I can tell you, well, guy, this is what I feel. I feel a little nervous coming out of your program, and I can narrate, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Okay. So that's, I can report on my subjectivity so we can at least have an access point. Right, right. That my dog doesn't have. Um, right. And, and our mind threes take us in a totally different, you know, that's the culture dimension of complexity is, is mind three. Yeah, yeah. That, those, these leaps of complexity. <laughs> I just, I think the, th the sense of, uh, I think this is what we were talking about before we started recording a bit, is like one of the things I really like about your thinking, right? And what I've experienced of it so far is it oftentimes like models explain things to me, right? But I don't like, they don't necessarily open up a sense of wonder. Like there's something about, uh, something about the way that you're talking about it where I actually get this sense, like I was just found myself thinking, oh yeah, like this leap into culture, right? This, this third level of mind. I just found myself just naturally going, oh God, man, whatever it is that even made that possible, what does that say about that, right? I just was like, there's these really, really big questions that um, I don't get the sense that you put a period on those questions, but you open up the questions, right, in a way of uh, making phenomena more accessible, but without, but without, without exhausting the mystery as if it well, was exhaustible, right? Right, no, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, uh, I'm, I, I do, so what I seek here is I'm seeking coherence, okay? Yeah. But my, and my orientation, my mental structure is a zoom out, seek coherence. Yeah. yeah that's, that's just what we're, where my default right. uh, logic uh, structure tends yeah. to. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I sort of saw the puzzle a little bit with psychology, and then I had my first, Insight in 1996 into 1997 was on this justification idea. Huh. Um, and I had the language of mind one to mind two to mind three, Ben. But yeah. I had the insight uh, that, that you and John were dialoguing about in terms of, okay, there's something that happens very important with language. Hmm. Um, and the basic story is, is in this, and this created a cleave between our primate selves and our person selves. Yeah. And, and I want to say the way you and John are talking about the person concept, that's the person culture plane of existence. Yeah. You know, often in my writing now, I often refer to us as human persons. Yeah. People think that's redundant, yeah. but it's not. Uh, at conception, I'm a, I'm a human zygote, and then I grow into a human being at birth, but I'm not a human person until right. the tension of justification yeah. gets involved. And right. I start to gain self-reflective awareness and start yeah. to take... Uh, self-conscious uh, accountability for my action on the social stage right an identity that's a that's the person culture dimension that now yeah. send to the animal mental dimension right I, mean, I believe I heard you talk about it before is like to get kind of get at this I think you were talking about you know that that um, we have narratives of you know on cartoons like you know a but like a sponge can be a person mm -hmm. Right. Yes. <laughs> like that. That it's it's not. It, I like that because it, it it takes it away from like as if a person was given with the human form. Right. Right. Well, th right. This is actually Peter Arcario is a psychologist I discovered maybe eight years ago or so. He developed. He he saw the problem of psychology very clearly uh, and developed what he called descriptive psychology. Hmm. Um, and it that was framed. That's actually what I would call a descriptive metaphysical approach, which is metaphysical and this guy, descriptive metaphysical is like, what's your concepts and categories? What is the definite, define, you know, Socrates like, define your terms. Right, right. That's actually a very good, <laughs> you want yes. to be about, you know, right. what you mean. And I realized that psychology is just a landmine and so did Osario. Yeah. And he, he uh, one of his most famous works was the behavior of persons and he really deconstructs. Um, and that's what he realized, like the concept of a person is something you grow into and learn how to play, basically. Yeah. Um, and he pointed out that in science fiction, 
you know, this is how he made it clear to me, like Jabba the Hutt in Star Wars, he's a person, right? Yeah. He's not a human, but he justifies why he took Leia and why, why yes. he's doing the things he's doing. He's a complete person at the full, and what is it that defined him as a clear person? The instantaneous, well, he justified his actions in a self-conscious way, you right. know, and, and navigated the social stage uh, as a ne- fr- with a narrative function. Yeah. That, that's what, uh, so it's a really, you're like, oh, yeah, you can really dissociate that concept from human beings. That's really interesting. Right. And that, and that gets, to, well, it's kind of, isn't it, isn't that the case with feral children, right? Where they're, well, where they, yeah, they're I mean, not they, on that human stage and it's past, past four years old and they, they were that. You have a sensitive period. Now it's, uh, you know, human development is super complicated and there's a, there's a lot of, but absolutely, man, you grow up in animal with animals. And this is a sensitive topic because legally there's a definition of person that, that transforms this, gets into yeah. issues of abortion debate and things like that. Right. But let's face it, um, at a, from a scientific descriptive explanatory way, mm-hmm. uh, I am a person, uh, 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 James Mark Baldwin said this very well, ego and alter are born together. Mm. Uh, ego and alter are born together. He was a developmental psychologist early, one of the great genius developmental psychologists. And, um, and that's true at both our attachment relational level. Mm. So in other words, the way we know the way an infant is co-regulated. Yeah, yeah. Why, why is circling so powerful? It's because right. mirroring an empathetic level of I see you in me, I mimic you, I imitate, yeah. you, I see where your attention is, and right. I feel the mirror, right? Yeah. At my phenomenological level. And that's what we built. We're very social, so we're very a team to mimicry and intention and in the social relational field, all pre-verbal. Yeah. But yeah. then you get the verbal side of the equation, right? right. And, and that's what the justification, and you guys were seeing that. It's like, well, wait a minute. I start to get out here in the stage, social stage, and there's all these rules and narratives and ideologies. Yeah. That, what is legitimate and what is not? Yeah. And other people occupy the social relational justification space. Yeah. And you're going to come into it and be in a person means hey why are you doing what you're doing <laughs> and is yeah. it okay yeah. and what are your reasons and and voila and so yeah. now it's a logical justificatory process um, yeah so very very it's a very very relational uh dialogue wow. yeah it's so interesting because i think one of the things um i know that in the email after the after our tough like you watched uh, me and john's last last mm-hmm. video about um where we were talking about you know, because I was trying to bring as you, I was trying to bring in what you were saying about justification into the what John and I have been talking about is as dial, dialogic going into dialogos and, and all yeah. of the phenomenal elements of that. Right. Um, which has just been fascinating for me and revealing actually revealing of experiences that I, I've continued to have, but bringing language to them, like has me be able to make them so much more distinct and like because mm-hmm. you can only relate to things that are distinct right it's, the, sure. it's like the language but where where i think it was john that said he, he came up with yeah dialogos right and i would also probably say circling right is 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 moving from the courtroom right to the courtyard right and it and it's interesting because i like that because i think what you're getting at is that you know, it's fu- it's tricky because you know I, I it's well you're a clinical psychologist too, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, yes. Yes. Uh-huh. And it's like that's the thing, like that. I mean, the super ego and the justification and, and all of that is like can be the things that just drive people crazy, right? Oh, absolutely. Oh, totally. So yeah. So uh, listen. The, so the, the just of it, what the justification dynamic opens up. I'll tell you this sort of this. Yeah. So the best way to really get a grasp of the layering of it. So there's actually really three layers and you guys caught two of them uh-huh. uh, and you were intuiting the third. So uh-huh. is the courtroom. Well, yeah. That is the defender. Okay. And that right. is when you're in conflict yeah. and a social pressure, not, I'm not being literal, but it could be, of course, literal. That's where the whole structure is. Now you're accused to be held accountable or punished as delegitimate. And then you have to defend your justification of yourself. Right. Okay. Right. So one, and that's one key feature. Yeah. And the argument actually is the structure of self-consciousness is in part mm. related to that. Mm-hmm. Right. The, the left hemisphere, 
the it isn't just a an analytic reasoning system. It is a defender when necessary. It you are it's yeah. and attached to the social field and your place of social influence. I have what's called the social influence matrix, okay, yeah. which yeah. is what your heart is tracking. And we have a barometer of social influence and relational value. Okay. Right. Right. And when other people know and value us and love us for the things we want to be loved for, that's great. I mean, that's nourished the soul. Yeah, right? yeah. That's what pulls us. And yeah. when other people are like, no, we're going to get critiqued. You're going to be ignored. You're going to be rejected. Oh, my God. I mean, that's a, I mean, that's a deep, that goes right into even basic physical pain. That's sort right. of, rude, yeah. right? Yeah. Rejection yeah. is like, you know. Yeah, that yeah it registers as physical pain in the. Oh, it does right? absolutely. It's a whole. It's very the, the emotional pain that comes out of that is very deeply connected. Right. Um, and I think John mentioned you know public speaking is uh, people will feel for for those that are public speaking phobic it's it's worse than death. I mean they will fill that out. It's, it's just yeah. absolutely. And the, so the idea of a crowd deciding that you have failed and you've humiliated yourself. Yeah. Is that in my cool way in a hunter gatherer society that's not too far away from death. Right. Right. So, not, it's not accidental. Um, so, so you have the courtroom side of your justify. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then there's the social pragmatic side. Yeah. Right. Okay. Which is the courtyard, basically. Yeah. And then the interesting thing about justification, it goes all the way up to analytic philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All the way up to that's what I discovered. I didn't really realize this, but I mean, mm -hmm. what is uh, uh, Plato realizes that the, his yeah. theory of knowledge is yeah. justified true belief. Yeah. So you have a tr propositional statement, right. you know, and it does it correspond to reality? Is it therefore true? The belief is it true? And what is the level of justification, analytic right. justification that l results in that correspondence? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so justification at the analytic level mm. actually then roots all of Western logos. Mm. So, the Western logos problem. What is what is analytically true, hmm. irrespective of social courtyard dialogos? This is why the analytic people will be like, "Oh, you dialogicians, you know who that?" <laughs> yes, right, <laughs> right. Analytically true, you know. It's like you guys right. can talk all you want, but I'm going to deduce my mathematical proof or whatever. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's analytic justification. Right, uh, right. So, so, so the justification. What I realize with this concept is, I go all the way from a Freudian idea. It yeah. totally explains why we have biological, psychological drives, right. not socially acceptable that we've internalized, and we sit with an ego-based justifier that's trying right. to rationalize and repress so that we navigate the reality of our social field. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, totally. You know, that's Freud's fundamental insight. Now we can put it totally on an evolutionary history. The evolution of language created that problem. Yeah, right. Right. Okay. So it's like, how, because when we now on a field of justification, people start asking questions. Well, why'd you do what you do? If you piss me off and we have a clash of social influence right. and with the, with the utility of language, questions are easy to ask. They're hard to answer. Um, yeah. And so how do you explain yourself? And if you're attacked and then the other issue is, well, how do you, we just get along? You know, how yeah. do we make sense out of stuff? You know, yeah. so what, I, what did I do? But then there's, what do we do in the courtyard? Why? Right. When do we get up and move together? That's our social pragmatic justification. Right, right. And then down the line, when they discovered mathematics, then it gave rise to formal analytic questions of justification, which are like, well, what is objectively true independent of the social and subjective, which, by the way, roots us ultimately into science. Yeah, it's yeah. Quest for, for, for justification independent of subject bias. Oh, yeah, totally. So, so it's just getting at that, so, that social aspect. I think it's, it's, is it fair to say so, something like, so you, what you're not saying is that like, it, I mean to talk, I mean to talk in, in like existential phenomenological terms, you're not saying that I am a being that then is social and then justify it's like, it's more like, no, I am the being that in its being is already always in a, in a social justification and oriented in that way and concerned about that and like it, it's like it's so, it's deep it's really deep. right am i right. getting so, that right absolutely and in fact so i mean deep into the phenomenological organization yeah okay. so um i don't know if you've seen a picture of the influence matrix if if you haven't and you show pictures on your thing i'd be happy to pull it up uh -huh. um, but the influence matrix maps the socio-emotional relational field of our phenomenology right okay. 
Okay? And what it shows is that it's just, it just is a depiction of how we're organized to track our place in the social field intuitively. Okay? Yeah. And yeah. that is fundamentally organizing. And then it organizes us in terms of our, we are fundamentally defined as attachment. You know, our firstborn activity, we know our mothers and fathers before we know ourselves. Yeah. Because yeah. we're looking for the co-regulatory structures of the other. Right. Where we are in the social world. And, this, and we are unbelievably intimate and social before the language. So, so yeah. an evolutionary level and an ontogenetic level, we are right. real beings. Right. right. The right. justification problem emerges on top of that and in that context. Yes. So even in the, even in the sense of like, you know, I, I, this is <laughs> this riddle I've been thinking about, you know, of where it is, you kind of get the point of it. it you know, mm -hmm. if I'm an artist, so I imagine I'm an artist and, mm -hmm. and I just, I paint the most incredible piece of art ever. Mm -hmm. And then the moment I'm done and I'm cherishing it and I think about it being seen by other people and I imagine them criticizing it, right? And so I can't tolerate the, the idea of being criticized. So I destroy the painting, right? Oh. So the question, the riddle is, is like, well, did, 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 I, did I avoid the criticism, <laughs> right? I mean, I think what you're, what you're kind of saying, you're kind of saying at the deepest level, really, no. In fact, we're always already in, it's like, it, is, it, is it fair to say that at an experiential level, like the way that my, my life is animated, right, shows up for me, glows mm -hmm. to me, is imbued with sociality, right? Absolutely. Right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and, and one of the great Western uh, weaknesses, I think, is that the, that fact is horribly underplayed with yeah. like transcendental ego and analytic justification emphasis right. Um, right. and individualistic, uh, you know, especially in the United States and its individualism. Um, we are, our social network of reality, the web of relation, you know, that we, uh, mm -hmm. that we are embedded in the both the mental and cultural levels of our existence. Right. So crucial. You know? Right. Um, uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, and I think we failed to fundamentally appreciate that. You know, I mean, hunter gatherers got this. I mean, hunter gatherers, yeah. and they knew the very dangerous aspect of human sociology was power. Right. Okay? right. So people would collect attention and power and influence. And actually, virtually all hunter gatherer systems are anti dominant. What it means is if you try to take more power than your share, mm. collective basically cuts you off. You get some warnings. Yeah. And there are a lot of stories of five hunters going out and four coming back because the yeah. guy was taking power in a way that he didn't get the message. <laughs> right, right, totally. They, they support, uh, uh, the matrix says there's love, power, and freedom are the process dimensions. Well, they emphasize love and freedom over power. You know? huh. To, so that we have collective mutuality because power yeah. is dangerous. Well, right. you know, we forgot, we did we bagged that idea. You know, we basically were like money and power and individual achievement. You know, yeah. I like to say we are Trump, not that I'm excited about that, but he's a caricature of the value, relational value structures of our yeah. society. You right. Know, money and power and asserting that you're right and doesn't matter and boom, boom, win, 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 win. It's yeah. Like, you know, talk to hunter gatherer people. They'll tell you <laughs> this is the right. you know you're guaranteed you're going to yeah. get relational sickness if this is the way you try to structure y your relational dimension because then people feel the resentment, they feel the the struggle, they want that power that everybody wants it because yeah. of ethics and it's just yeah. you know so it's a very 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 there's a big dynamic here. We have to figure out pathways of love and freedom over power. That's for sure. Right. Totally. So so the thing about um. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the ways that, like, one of the ways that, you know, if you, I, I sometimes think about this too, is this level of, like, I mean, this is, this stuff is just fascinating to me. And this is one of the things I've learned in circling and just mm -hmm. being in relationship. If we say circling is kind of a, and this is what I love to kind of talk with you about, of, like, from the model of just articulating some of the things that happen in circling right, and my right. experience in dialogos mm -hmm. and everything we've been talking about that, that seem to be so central right and one of the one of the reasons why i think circling is and actually the role of technology too around this like what okay. what is the like what is the impact you know and a lot of this really comes out of my grappling with heidegger for okay. for the last 20 something years right mm. where he talks about are you familiar with his work around technology 
reasonably, but this is on my to-do list, especially with uh, um, yeah. John and everything else. Yeah, so I actually have a list right here, and I have a couple of Heidegger things I need to check out. So I'm underdeveloped on Heidegger. I'd love to learn. Cool. I'll, 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 talk to, I'll talk with you about Heidegger anytime. Right? Brilliant. I, Brilliant. Yeah, so yeah, really edify, edify me. I, yeah. Edify me. So basically, it's just kind of like his, his sense is, is he really highlighted how um, that, we, that we don't, it, he's not talking about technological mechanisms or devices. He's talking about an understanding of the being of being. So the context of context, right? Like the background sense of what, by virtue of which anything is at all to us, how, the, the as structure, right? Yes. Like okay. as a person, yeah. as an object. Yep. He's just right. basically saying, he's saying like technology has this way of, of his, like things show up as positions, mm -hmm. right? As, a, um, as available for extraction of energy for endless order ability. And right. then even our bodies, right? Even our bodies, like we look at like body, you know, mind yep. hacking, right? All the, Good. all, you know. So yep, I can mind that directly. Okay, perfect. But, but where my, where my, where I've been really interested in, in, in going well, how the why did circling right? To, a few guys like dorky dudes, right? Like <laughs> use of childhoods, right? Like, like stumble along this thing about relating that glowed to us. What within within fifteen twenty years? How did that go, get all over the world? That practice, right. and right. and so I I I feel that 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 on one level the answer to that is what circling is, right? Yep. I think at another level, it also discloses a lot about the world, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. And yep. I've, I've just wondered about, you know, with given that this justification dynamic is so central to like the structure of our being, right? In a certain sense, yes. right? And mm -hmm. we're always mm -hmm. in it. Um, mm -hmm. And that for, for years and years and years, most of that has, has almost all of it has been like it, it, it's done where I say stuff and you, it's in direct response to other bodies, right? And all these different yep. things. What happens right. where all of a sudden there's a division now where I can uncollapse the relational dynamic, which, you know, there's tons of morality and, and ethics and stuff Completely. that just happen in our bodies. Right. When, when like we outsource all of our communication to where you don't have that immediacy, yep. right? Where yes. most of my friends are people I've never met, right? And it's through text exchange, and there's now a division. And I, I have a feeling that, that you know, 35 years ago, if we say that circling, say, is like a a, a, a relational yoga, mm -hmm. before technology, right? In in this mm -hmm. sense, social technologies. I don't know if it would even make sense to do that because on so, so many levels, there was so much interaction by virtue of living, right? That if you had to, if I, if I had to like exchange information, I had to at least call you and deal right. with the courtroom, right? Basically. Yep, yep. absolutely. Right. What is like, what, what yeah. do you, like when you look at like, oh, like what yeah, is so, the, okay. yeah. So lots, lots to say there, lots mm -hmm. to say. So first off, yes, I would certainly say if we go back to hunter gatherers, certainly, like, well, that's sort of what we do. <laughs> yeah 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 totally right. yeah. so let's if we say that then we're like yes i think you are reinventing i think what you did is essentially reinventing the way we're structured right huh. okay. and had lost yeah okay so now let's go with your heidegger point let's go back that's to a that. good invention now it's I'll beautiful i mean dude that. it's like it's like that on my, my website <laughs> it's all part of what we need for it's, it's a central part of what yeah. we need Two, what I call Enlightenment 2.0, which is a fundamental reboot so that we actually align our knowledge and wisdom yeah. structures and our practices Yeah. with our nature. Yeah. That's, that's what we screwed up. We right. don't know. We gave it over to science. I had a, I had a conversation with a, uh, one of my nephews uh, at a family reunion a year ago. And I was like, oh, he's had two, two classes in college. Like, well, what did you learn? Well, basically, I'm all just a bunch of chemicals. Yeah. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> like that you, we your your parents my brother and sister put spent twenty thousand dollars and you your yeah. philosophy of life now is that you came back and your cares and your loves and your is that what you really realize you know so they had a, a physical reductionism okay? right. physical physical reductionism right? which is just which is wrong and what does that do to you hmm. okay. right okay so so look, that's a tragedy yeah. right? 
So now let's go to what Heidegger is catching. Yeah. Right? yeah. Heidegger is catching what I do know about Heidegger is fundamentally organized around the essence of care. Yeah. Bingo. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. And, and how we position ourselves in relationship to the environment. Yeah. To move. Okay. Yeah. Well, by the way, that I didn't know how to, I mean, I, but the joint point from life to mind is called behavioral investment theory. Right. And what it says is the nervous system is an investment value system that organizes the expenditure of your work energy. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Value. In other words, at its essence, it is a care system, value system. Okay. Yeah. And it's orienting. So, I, so from that arrangement, Heidegger's going through phenomenology, but this right. up through nervous system, evolutionary nervous system. The yeah. fit, we don't know about them, but actually if we see their behavior, we can see what they care about in terms of their behavior. Yeah. Right. All right. So, so that, so we, let's talk about care there. Now let's go from my fish. Okay. To dogs and then primates, the social mammals. Right. Mm -hmm. All the way up into our pre-verbal ancestors who lived in unbelievably complicated, close-knit, gathering, Dunbar number communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay? Right. Where, where my whole existence is fundamentally dependent upon what the women gather and what the men bring home to hunt and right. where they are together. Right. 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 Okay. Right. So, and so now what we have is not just a me versus the environment and caring about the environment, but it's me existing in a field of relation, what I call social influence and relational value. Right. Right. Okay? And what I'm tracking, what the unified theory says that we are tracking in our relationship system is the experience of being known and valued by important others. Yeah. Yeah. So that again, it's the experience of being known and valued by important others. That's the barometer. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Because if I'm known and valued, other people will work on my behalf. And if I'm not, I am. In other words, if I'm cared for yeah. okay, and care about in a reciprocal circling. Yeah. Okay. Right. So what it does to my mind is that what it does is create a culture to enhance our mutual relational value. Yeah. Because I, when I mirror you and you mirror that back to me, right. it's like it's, it spreads agape. It spreads. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it makes people like, I, I, like, I like what John highlighted in his yeah, theories right. about agape. Well, that was, yeah. Right. It, that's the, that is the energy. That's the relational energy. And then we just learn how to justify. And what happens is if you learn how to justify on a foundation of love, then you become your true self. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because then you're known in value. This is what right. Carl Rogers saw, right? Carl yeah. Rogers was like, as a therapist, I'm going to create a context of non-judgmental acceptance, right. unconditional positive guard, and accurate foundational empathy to the organismic valuing process of the individual. Yeah, yeah. That's what Rogers yeah. does. So I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to see you, Guy. I'm going to see all that you're trying to do with circling. I'm going to see all that you have accomplished and all your fears and hopes, and I will create a context of fundamental accurate empathy and yeah. basically agape love. Right, right. And the idea is, oh my God, that's why I called actually the private to public, the Rogerian filter. Yeah, yeah. Because if you are unconditionally accepted, mm -hmm. the essence of your desiring self for both expression to be known and valued, if you hook the heart and your head and my relational world, then that's the right. social flow that leads to flourishing and, and realize, realization. Right. It's potential. It's yeah. that's actualization. That's the trend. That's the growth towards self-actualization because you get the feel. When you say, well, I love you if right. you believe in me and you do what I say, well, <laughs> right. Right. totally right. different ballgame. Now all of a sudden you got the public private. Now you got to lie. Now you got to hide. Now you got to defend. And you create all the static between the heart, the head, and the relational world. Right. It's like a defensive. Yeah. A defensive, defensive. Exactly. Yeah. You go right into the body, right? It's a, a polyvagal nerve theory and basically like, oh, shit. Somebody's going to judge me. Somebody's, I'm all of a sudden in the right. room here. I'm not yeah. in the yard anymore. And yeah. now I'm in a position. Now I got to defend, car carve out my territory. And if yeah. other people do that, boom, now you get the reverses, right? You get, you get the maladaptive cycle of chaos. Right. So interesting how when you think about, and when we think about the, how the West basically, it, it, it ritualized that structure in the court system, right? The courtroom, it seems like it's almost like a perfect, like, 
like archetype of that, right? That's right. It's, well, it's a professionalization and codification of justification. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. The defense. That's exactly what it is. They had to create a, they at once before when we could all do it and sit around in a Dunbar number where, and it was all about reputation and indigenous, you know, right. uh, and you would do something and you make up and blah, blah, blah. But obviously at the level of civilization, I thought when there are thousands of people involved, okay, there was yeah. to adjudicate. So we had to create, in fact, this is what civilization did, is it took what was the indigenous level of justification, court uh, room, uh, courtyard stuff, the real level of, hey, I know you and you know me and we have our history and we have our shared narratives and our mythic mm -hmm. structure of what our community believes. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then we built civilization. Mm -hmm. well, and now you have to have a top-down broadcast structure of some formal system yeah. uh, that creates a hierarchy that everybody then downloads the ideology and then you have to have more and more complicated rule structures that then adjudicate, you know, because you can't do it based on um, indigenous negotiation. Right, right. There's a, so there's like, um, and one of the things that you said, I, and I, want, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about too, was, you know, what you, you talked about something about, well, okay, um, there's, like there's a thing, there's a, there's a threat, right? A thing that we can do now called like with, with conversation, which is reverse engineer, mm -hmm. right? That, can, can you talk a little bit about that? Like, like one of the big innovations, if you will, right? Was this ability to converse and then reverse engineer like your justification through conversation, right? Right, right. right. So, uh, so when I talk about reverse engineering, what I'm trying to, what I mean there in the formal sort of academic sense, okay, is what I did is I reverse engineered the interpreter uh, function of the self-consciousness system. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so in other words, rather than the, it, we have the experience of just generating our beliefs, okay, and the yeah. are just descriptions of what's going on and sort of what we think, but this is just what we see. Yeah. Right? And what may, what propositionally makes sense out of us. Yeah. Well, the justification hypothesis tells you, no, actually, that thing's running a particular kind of program. Right, right, totally. <laughs> it totally. is functionally organized. Those beliefs are not coming at you randomly. Right. <laughs> Those beliefs are selectively structured to build a justifying narrative. Yeah. Okay? Based on your history and current context of the social field, originally right. as a child, yeah. and once you build your own self-concept system of justification that creates at an adolescent level, you now have this whole other level of, well, what am I to myself as I dialogue with myself at the private level? Right. Totally. Okay. Yeah. So right. that's internalized. What's just a, yeah, yeah, that's internalized. And then that creates the, normally the superego is then the interject. It was, well, all right, I have to internalize all the authority inside of me so that I screw up. All right. And, yeah. and so that I, punish myself before other people do because it's a lot better if I punish myself. Yeah. Right. That's why people will throw it out. They'll throw out the artwork or whatever it is. Yeah. And, oh God, they'll people will because nothing would be worse than it's better to not get up on stage than get booed off stage. Yeah. Yeah. Booed totally. off stage is really a life threatened. You can at least criticize yourself. So you internalize the critic, especially for folks if you have a particular structure, a history. I mean yeah. we do to some extent. Uh, psychopaths tend not to, but <laughs> I mean, that's another structure about why you know, there's all this individual difference. But if you have a neurotic temperament and you're somewhat conscientious, man, you're, you're, you've now internalized the authority and you're vulnerable. You'll be walking around with that anticipatory judgmental other, this, the harsh critic superego right. and anticipate that. Uh, yeah. So by reverse engineering, once you know to look at the consciousness system from the mind to phenomenology, okay, so that especially organized to the matrix, okay, yeah. trying to get its energy out a particular way, you have the internalized narrator that has a realistic justifier. And I did see this all the time. Uh, if you know anything about family systems therapy or any, you know, basic tr Eric Byrne transactional analysis, where right? yeah. a child and a parent and a healthy adult, I see this all the time. So the healthy adults just trying to navigate, but then you, you carry around this, this real critic, you know, from yeah. that learning issue and that, yeah. that filter, you know, and, and yeah. so we can reverse engineer it by saying, well, what are those, where did that, what's that system trying to do? Yeah. It's internalizing yeah. the judgments of authority and right. so trying to make sure that your child doesn't misbehave because when you, or screw things up because you'll be punished. So you're preemptively doing that. 
Yeah, totally, totally. Or oh, and and then for yeah, and anticipating it, projecting it, indexing it onto the world, and then right. It right. seems it seems like that. That's how you know it's kind of like you know you see this all the time where people have they'll have you know twelve marriages and somehow oh. the same husband or same right. just with different names, right? This this sense of like when it's of risk, well right right. It structures that the act of trying to solve the problem becomes the the enacting of the problem, right? Absolutely. Because, yeah. So, so you have a, the whole point is then that justifying system, okay, it has it's in relationship to the phenomenological system. Yeah. And all the psychological analyses say, yeah, the harmony of that, which Freud nailed most, you know, initially, and then we talk what I call the Freudian filter, yeah. the relationship between what do you repress. And what do you rationalize and the structure of defense that your lawyer part of your mind right. tell yourself and other people about your feeling part? Yeah. 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 All right. Totally. So that's, that's the, so your own internal courtroom. All right? right. You know, and then what does it do when you, when you judge yourself, that's unacceptable. You then create the shadow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Totally. So you fill totally. out the repress. It's not like the feeling self goes away. It now right inhibited and repressed and builds up can't get expressed it gets fractured into yeah. episodic feeling states okay? right. you know? but now that creates a pressure you know and people will very often split off an attack i got a blog that went a little viral called split off an attack okay? uh -huh. right and what happened it actually was a story with her and one of her friends and they were both interested in a boy and they had expressed interest in my daughter and yeah. they Dating. Well, all of a sudden, this friend got super nasty towards her. Uh, huh. I, I know people out there can't believe that this would happen, but <laughs> right, right. Or, or forty-five year olds, by the way. Right. Yes, <laughs> right. yes, right, right. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. but I, I listened to a little bit of the story, and it was a pretty clear narrative that she yeah. was wounded. She felt jealous and envious, but yeah. couldn't articulate that. Yeah. She didn't have a way to express that, and then just felt uncomfortable every time she was around my daughter. Uh, you know. Right? right, and would feel both a sense of shame that she couldn't identify, and an aversion, and an anger that something wasn't fair. Yeah. But she could say what, you know? Um, yeah, any kind of weirdness that would make be ambiguous it was always like, "Well, you do that, and you always do that." And, you know, so it was just it would leak out, you know? Yeah, and the yeah. shadow would leak out, you know? Right. You know, we of course we see that. Once you know how to look for it, that is what, right. What so many humans do, you know? Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, shining the light on our shadow, the, the shadow work of young or, you know, from an integral perspective or, or psychodynamic or whatever, is so important to understand how when we split off, we create filters to then see the world, yeah. justifying it. Right. And that's, but that's the part where, whereas I, I noticed in kind of like with circling, like a, lot, a lot of times what happens is people, people don't, people, how you come to realize your shadow isn't 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 just like reflecting on it right although when you reflect on it there's still the social aspect going on even in the reflection right self-reflection right, right but like getting involved in communities that tell the truth in their experience you, you can start to un right you start to see the thing that you're projecting on them Completely. right Completely. I had a, I, I did a blog on this too. It was, it was a, I know when we actually haven't done it, this would be sort of an intense uh, yeah. for a community. It's called the Backstory Project. Uh -huh. okay. Right, right. All right. So this is, and this is, you're exactly right about how we actually learn because we have so many blind spots. We yeah. can help for introspection with our blind spots. So here's the backstory. What you do with the backstory is you have a clinical psychologist and a lawyer lead a group of all the people that are important to you. Mm discussion room while you stand behind a one-way mirror yeah and, th and they get the conversation going about all these people about what's wrong with you <laughs> right right totally yes okay in right. other words the backstory about what do the hell do people tell about you behind your back when the filtering in between pilot and you're not around yes yes so you get a psychologist and a lawyer to basically make the guide people to make the case against you oh, no. right right Right. And then obviously you guys keep going crazy on the backside of the one main mirror. You're like, that's yeah. me. <laughs> right? Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because right? you'd be like, oh, that's not what I meant. And, you know, then you'd have to, you'd decompensate, you know, and yeah. then you had the ego strain and you're actually able to come back from that. Yeah. And then you went through where everybody sort of had to do it. Then yeah. 
sudden, what would that do is it, it's, it's a cleansing. It would allow the shadows to be seen from yeah. interpersonal field, yeah. interpsychic field. Yeah. That's where they show up. You know, you want other people to see your shit. How oh, easy- so interesting. So you know, interesting. How easy it for us to see other people bullshit. You know, we see this right. all the time. Hey, he's such a bullshitter. How hard is it to see when we're bullshitting? Okay. Oh, interesting. I think we've done that. Like uh, oh, in, really? uh, in advanced courses, right? Because you're, okay, well, and also yeah. we, we would talk about it as kind of like, kind of like the, especially the, like the, the sense of the narcissistic wound, right? The kind yeah. of the insult of, of needing to be reflected in a particular way. And if, sure. you know, if you don't like, I'll hate you or, <laughs> right. Or I'll dissolve. But the, but where we would have everyone in the group who would know each other for a while, like, mm -hmm have a conversation, a gossip conversation, right? As the other person would just sit in the corner. Okay, well there and it is. They, and, the, and the person, and, and the per, we, we'd set it up to where, okay, the person actually, it, the, the, the goal, the game, winning the game is really to like find out where you got hooked, where yeah. it's like you wanted to jump in there, right? And then yes, notice exactly. all those spots. Brilliant. And then they come up and we circle them. Right. Okay. Then, uh, then they start circling of like, okay, right. where was the place I couldn't be with that? Right. Right. And right. those, ex like though that exercise was on some level the most treacherous, right? Yeah. Like, right. Um, right. but also the most revealing, right? Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's so cool. That's super yeah. cool that you actually did that. Cause that was just yeah. an experiment. I was like, oh, you know, you want to know, you want to get to the root. And then I was like, Jesus, you know, you better have a decent, you better have people that can tolerate, you better be in yeah. a big course, right? Because so yeah. many people and then once it's revealed and once you're humiliated you yeah. get humiliated and you know and there's not trust and then all of a sudden you're like oh my god you really think that people can't tolerate and then like up oh, it'd be very you know that is a very, that's our terror our terror is the rest of the people really don't love us yeah. uh, and then if you actually saw it and then felt yeah. it and it emerged in a way that you couldn't metabolize it'd be it's scary definitely but if you could do it right mm -hmm. you build the foundation yeah. you get you clear the shadow shit out yeah the foundation of of connection right. You actually can talk about you know what's really going on and if you have that you can then get rid of you know because so much of it just built up out of miscommunication yeah totally cool. and it's all it's in it, it's just the sense of that I, and i often thought about um and i think about this is where i also i just think the catholic church is just brilliant right with confessions right mm -hmm. just this idea of like just the idea of the aware or the insight that yeah oh just say it like reveal your shame right and it's like absolutely that revelation is is a is a restoration of some kind now you Huge. know it gets you know it got Huge. dogmatic and all that stuff but right like, no but the point of it notice yeah. is if you from a unified theory perspective what we have is informational interface okay the way to understand so you have a the neurocognitive system that's not conscious into the cognitive system that the consciousness system that's mind two okay and you have mind three when you're repressing you have mind two shit bouncing around into mind one, but you're not narrating it. Yeah. So there's a disintegration, and it's a big difference just to say it to yourself than to yeah. actually say it into what I call the public mind three space, where you actually have another person that can hold you accountable. Yeah. And of course, they protect it because it is dangerous, and we do say in psychotherapy, it's also, I mean, it's so yeah. confidential, same basic process, right? Yeah. Go and you confess your sins. Um, right. And, and by gaining mirroring about what the things that scare you, you can actually then start to use mind three to work them through and understand their interrelations because it's the building of the narrative and the affect that is so crucial. It's, it's that constructive right. network bridge. Right. And that's that quality of, uh, I've often thought about, you know, a lot of times like when that, in that private conversation with yourself, right. Mm -hmm. Of, of where you're justifying it with yourself, but you like, mm -hmm. you're, like there's some place that you're inauthentic out here, so you're justifying mm -hmm. it. Totally. I think it's almost like the mode of, I've often noticed like the mode of, of that conversation seems to be about um, talking to yourself so that you're not caught off guard and surprised, right? Yeah. With, sure. with whatever it is that's like messing with you, right? Whatever mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. that you're unsettled about. But I think it's kind of like the, it it's in disclosing yourself voluntarily like voluntarily subjecting yourself to a place of risk risking yep. humiliation risking those sure. things mm -hmm. seems to be it seems to be on a very it's a co completely different thing than if it was revealed by surprise oh right? god 
Oh, like of course. it's Absolutely. that volunteerness that right. seems to right. be where the, the, the development and the at, character comes out, right? At every level, at every level. So, uh, so if we think about it in this way, I mean, you can look at a brain system that's in a reactive state versus yeah. regulated by voluntary control states. Okay. Yeah. I mean, at, at a very base level, a voluntary control behavioral regulation system is very different than a reactive yeah. system. Okay. Yeah. Reactive systems are designed to be defensive and get you the hell out of there because you don't know, you didn't expect this, yeah. and this is an absolute threat, but you haven't even sized it up yet. Right, right. It's like a straight to your core fear. Okay? Yeah. So an unexpected injury <laughs> is designed to send electricity through your body and for you to jump back as far as possible and push everything away that's coming at you. Right. Uh, right? Right. Right. Now, and so like when we do phobias, you know, everything, uh, the phobic, treatment, you know, is get the person's efficacy into a place where you think, I think I can handle this. Yeah. Okay? And, you know, and it's, and the skill is getting that healthy ego to say, hey, yes, I want to confront this. I want to be told this scary thing about me. Yeah. I want to see the picture of the dog. Okay. Yeah. If they don't have that, okay, then this yeah. system, they don't have control. So they need cognitive, a justificatory control, and ideally behavioral investment control. And if they're in that system, then they can metabolize. Yeah. And right. grow because they have a sense of mastery. They have a sense that they're investing and in regulating the system right. and they can grow. If they're getting, they get side, you know, and if something comes out of the space of you, you're just in a completely, you know, you're up a corner in the dark. And the only bodily response is escape and get this away from you. And it hurts. And why would you right. do that to me? Why would you hurt me so bad in a way that I can't understand? So it's. Yeah. A, an inability to you can't metabolize it. it just makes it worse it would be right. now terrified with a whole nother layer of, of fear yeah so yeah it's, it's so interesting i'm just appreciating kind of like the frame like how a lot of this stuff is is your it's so integrated into the system it just makes so much sense but it's also kind of made sense in the way of like one of the like one of the issues i've had around around circling in the greater community of it right is mm -hmm. Because whenever this, whenever this kind of confrontational, like, like psych, like the, uh, it feels like remnants of, of, of the, of you know, encounter groups and yep. stuff like that, where it's like where aggression's just like let to go. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I there's a, there's something in me that just seems it it just I I it's it something cringes inside because it's been actually my experience of that you no know, there's what this takes is a virtue of reverence right i think that's what the practice of of circling essentially is 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 really um encouraging cultivating mm -hmm. and how in guiding right is, right right because the you know when you're defensive and you're anticipatory and you're like in your unresolved like the last thing that you can do is actually contact the otherness of the other, right? No, you you dominate by fear for self. Right. You other when you're dominated by fear for self. Definitely. So like cultivating reverence. Yes. And it's the thing I've noticed is like just like actually it's a lot more people are already confronted. Like it's right. not a mat all you gotta do is get present with them. Right. And allow what so to be there. And people will be confronted with the, what they're actually existentially confronted with, right? It's in yes. the structure of our being, right? We don't totally. need to. We don't need no, to. No, I, I think you need to be very careful about. There are a couple of things yeah. that uh, that come to mind with that, and and I don't know enough about the circling community. To yeah. have much in a yeah. way of differentiated um, the value to frames, but um, certainly I know enough about confrontation. I know enough about emotional expression. I know enough about the history of some of the movements that that gave yeah. rise to um, you know the freedom to express aggression in particular kinds yeah. of ways. Okay, yeah. um, which is very, it's a very dangerous thing, let's be yeah. clear. Okay, so it has to be contained. I think your board reverence is unbelievably key. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. to me, what that goes to is, yes, it's the experience of relational value that each person yeah. at the core, the core of their true self, which seeks to be known and valued, right. to be held. And if yeah. we're not holding that, if we're creating a space in which that is actually threatened and the trust is broken on that, yeah. then drop into defense, and yeah. the right. capacity for the constructive circling process to enact. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, that's a rule. That's a basic, you know, if you want to be, cons if the 
all of circling is constructive relating at some level. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, then that's a, you have to have the reference principle. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like if it is, is, um, and the ability to become in reverence with somebody seems to be about, because reverence, my understanding of reverence is what makes it reverence is it implicitly is it recognizes that one, your own limitations, right? Mm -hmm. um, and being faced with something that is, has so much like a beyondness, right? That I right. can conquer, right? That's right. where it leads, like reverence leads to awe. So there's that sense of moreness, right? So right. being able to look at somebody in contacting reverence means you're contacting not your, your judgments or assertions about who somebody is, but like precisely that you're contacting the mystery that they are. Right, right. right. And everyone, and then, every, right. if you're looking at the universe, that's available. Right, right. That's it. the, I mean, it's a spiritual dimension, right? Yeah. But then that, for me, then that hooks into the spiritual dimension, yeah. you know, yeah. of ultimate concern yeah. and what the ultimate value structures. Right. That then guide us. Uh, right. the, so I have, a, I have a saying that says, be, you know, in a Heideggerian sense, if you were, um, that which enhances dignity and well being with integrity. Right. Right. Uh, so, whereby dignity and well being and integrity yeah. are my big three value structure. Yeah. yeah. Okay? yeah. And, and, and I mean, and for, for me, then reverence gets into the, the whole thing's reverence, but it's about dignity, is about the beauty and respect of each of us individually. Right humanity as a whole yeah yeah and, and is that is having reverence for that human as a whole and each of us individually right that that to sort of honor toward right give honor to right absolutely hold in, hold in esteem and i think that's where though that level of perception and cultivating that this is where I think that people start to use, I mean, John's talked about this. It's been fun having John go to circling and then hearing mm -hmm. his observations about like from his right, dad, right, yeah, no. You know, yeah. about, he, one of the things he picked up on right away was this kind of like this, like circling is a secular, by definition, it's a secular process, mm -hmm. but people have the experience, have these very spiritual experiences and use this kind of spiritual language Right, and I think a lot of it has to do with it's because you're continually, voluntarily, like listening to the other, right, in their humanity and disclosing yourself and you're getting that auto-poetic process, right, that you start to touch into this sense of, on one level, the person's unique, once occurrence suchness, essence or something like that. Right. But right. it's also, there's a, like that becomes transparent to this like the the it, kind of an, uh, a fountain of intelligibility that's beyond all of us yes. and that starts to move into the conversation right yep. and you start to experience it people have experience that is like a spiritual Completely. religious terms right yes that's yes it. and i and i love i'm i'm a naturalist but i love yeah. i i embrace the word soul and spirit yeah uh, in terms of my I wouldn't have 10 years ago, but now I do. So, so spirit, you know, my soul refers to my unique perspective, right. uh, my perspectival knowing from the interior okay? yeah. and the functional form of my life at the biological, psychological, and social right. levels in an Aristotelian sense. Yeah. Okay? Um, yeah. The spiritual aspect of that is that which orients me towards my ultimate moral concerns, my moral ethical. Right. Concerns, okay. Right. Uh, which then orients me often to my experience of being in oneness toward in the good. So it's yeah. the, the fundamental. Okay? Right. And as a human primate, when I feel a part of something and we are building practices and justification systems that are distributing this goodness, yeah. right? Yeah. That's the embodiment. That is right. the embodiment of that. So you, you feel the phenomenological lift. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And this kind of sense of also Tillich, that ultimate concern. Yeah, I love Tillich. Absolutely. It's yeah. great. Yes, like, no, I, I love, you know, absolutely. And, and I this, love this tension I mean, the, between the individuation and, and, and participation. Oh, yeah. the, I, this is like articulates all of it, right? Right, right. Well, that, that and I mean, all of society deals with this. I'm no, I mean, we're all, what are we as individuals? What are we as this self and society, the yeah. self and other, the relational dynamics between all of that? And if we can freely come into harmony with one another and feel known and valued at our essence. Yeah. Oh. Right. 
That's what it's all about. <laughs> totally. It's really, it really is. So what is it like, you know, what's it like for you? I'd love just to hear like a little bit more about, um, you know, one is like, how is it that you came to, to, to creating a, basically a unified field theory of a whole branch of science, right? I doubt, yeah. I mean, I doubt like after you graduated high school, you're like, if I asked you what you're doing, you, you probably weren't like, well, I- No, it was a story. It's definitely college. not in high school, yeah. right? Yeah. I, was, I was skipping school and smoking pot in high school, so. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> I, I, was, I was like, you know, I had a little bit of a reading trouble. I was not thinking that I was going to then, you know, right. create a theory of knowledge, you know, that I would say, hey, this is going to be crucial to the Enlightenment 2.0 transition in the 21st century. No, yeah. it's a transition in my 20s that happened. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. So my identity has been a very interesting, you know, experience because uh -huh. yeah, it's uh, uh, the in terms of the short developmental narrative, um, I got uh, I, I was I didn't care much about school in high school. You know, I did well enough. I got into James Madison, where I ended up returning as a professor. Uh, and then I got well, I found that I had some interesting capacities to understand things in, yeah. in undergrad, not. Yeah. Back, but but good. Yeah. I could quickly learn arguments that people were making, and I had basically a, a quasi-level reading disability, so I didn't read much. Okay. Huh. So yeah. then, uh, and then I got, and then I could realize I understood. Then I got curious. Actually, feminism is my first intellectual awakening, um, and, huh. and sociology. Right. I got. I realized that actually I've, I'm one of four boys, um, and although my parents were relatively enlightened, there was definitely a significant gender power differential between them. Yeah. Uh, and that I wouldn't have been aware of until I took a feminist and sociology class. Huh. Basically, was like you know the whole structure of narrative here is biased, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. In a way that you know I was like, I was like, hey, I didn't really see that before. And right. Now yeah. I realized it, and then I brought that home to my mom, who was also sort of waking up to another layer of feminism in her. We actually bonded around that. Yeah. Um, and then I went into graduate school. Mm. Um. And by that time, I was actually, I started to be able to absorb a lot pretty quickly. Um, mm. And I got really fortunate in my master's. I had a terminal master's in clinical community psychology at University mm. of Carolina, Charlotte. Great professors there. Actually, the folks who built uh, Rich Tedeschi and Lawrence Calhoun, who are now, actually now, relatively well-known for what's called post-traumatic growth. Um, mm. they, that term. And they were their original researchers in post-traumatic growth. Um, so, and that, Lawrence Calhoun was my... Uh, thesis advisor and Rich Tedeschi was my advanced psychotherapy professor. Yeah. He was a wonderful psychotherapist. They're both wonderful mentors. Um, and he was able to give me a deep appreciation for both the practice and the paradigm of the major approaches. Yeah. Uh, so this is 1994. Um, and then I'm like, wow, you know, I used to be CBT because I was this sort of empiricist psychologist. That's right. what I was trained as. Okay. Yeah. Um, which I thought empirical. Well, that's, that's the right way to go because if yeah. Natural science, that's what real truth is, and all this other yeah. fluff, yes, you know. Right, right. Then I was like, man, you know, you look at all this other stuff. Freud maybe wasn't so crazy, and boy, did Rogers get a heck of a lot, right? And, you know, the right. same people. And actually, I then had a supervisor that wasn't very effective from a cognitive perspective. And so I just sort of like yeah. woke up to the fact that these paradigms in psychotherapy all have brilliant things to say, you know? Yeah. But when they're done by the best of the best, you listen to them, you're like, yeah, they're seeing something. Yeah. yeah. So, so then I, and then, and then, like I said, what's my, one of my ways of thinking that I sort of have a talent about is jump back and cohere, <laughs> you know, sort of like jump back and cohere. And yeah. so, that, and that was a perfect intersection between psychotherapy and its com complex, chaotic paradigms with all the interesting things. So I jumped back to take a look at them and say, well, why don't they cohere? Yeah. Like, it was really my first problem is the problem of psychotherapy. Right. Okay? Right. 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 So then when I did that, I was like, but I knew that psychotherapy was a value-based enterprise. Yeah. Okay? yeah. So in other words, if you, do you care about truth or do you have happiness? You know? Right. right. Like, well, if you care about truth, you care about happiness. Those are two different things. You're, if you're in one inside of yourself, you know, do you care about systems and justice? What do you care about? Right. So the different psychotherapies. So then I was like, well, I, well what do, then I asked, moved from, well, what about psychotherapy to at least of simpler questions? Well, what about psychology? If, if modern day biology is the applied application of biomedical engineering kinds of stuff 
based on human biology, why would psychotherapy be based on the science of psychology? Yeah, yeah. And so 1995, 1996, I made that jump. And that's when I re-looked at psycho psychology yeah. and was like, that's when it started to dawn on me is it was not a coherent discipline. Right, right. I actually fa- fell in love for two years with evolutionary psychology, the academic mm-hmm. discipline of evolutionary psychology. I was very impressed. Mm-hmm. I've grown up on the feminist, uh, some of the early wave feminist stuff about that was very environmentalism. It's like, well, if you believe in evolutionary theory and the gender differences, you're basically a Nazi. <laughs> I mean, I, that's what right, I had. Right. Then I realized, oh my God, there's all this, you know, there are real yeah. reasons to believe. There's really yeah. differences and, and key areas. And this is not Nazis, it's just science and all this yeah. stuff. Um, so I fell in love with evolutionary theory, um, while a lot of my friends were pretty skeptical of that, uh, but I then sort of then disappeared into my own world. And by that time, I was, my reading disorder was gone, and I was chewing up a lot of information. Oh. Turned into a bookworm, uh, 1995, oh. 96. So um, I went to the University of Vermont uh, to study, but basically, I was just now on my, an autodidactic. I was just on my own, uh, right. chewing up everything I could. Um, wow. Then I trained in my dissertation was I did a social psych stuff for my master's degree and then my dissertation was on Beck's cognitive errors um, and I got trained in psychodynamic work by really well uh, and and I was reading up on evolutionary theory and so this was 1996 1997 yeah. uh, so, and then that's when the insight about justification happened uh, so, yeah so I, I and then had the evolutionary analysis of Freud's key insight. Yeah. And then I was, for six months, I was just obsessed with that. Once you see people as justifiers, you know, I went through a whole evolution of insight in those six months. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, every Friday, Saturday night, I would engage in some herbal medicine, which would release Mm -hmm. some, uh, uh, you know, constraints and allow me to be creative. And then sometime in the fall of 1997, um, was, um, creatively exploring the cosmos as it were the tree yeah. of knowledge jumped out at me okay and i drew it out in 30 seconds there's 30 seconds four upside down cones matter life mind culture i have the original diagram uh. and i mean just you just it's just a the the yeah uh, integration of that transcendental moment right and, and i did blog a, a dual part blog series uh on his because i listened to him talk about transcendental experiences right exactly what mine was although mine was interesting as john says a lot of transcendental experiences happen at the phenomenological optimal grip of your intuitive sense of self in the world yeah i had that and i had a logos map (laughs) yeah exactly so it's like all of a sudden this logo left so my left hemisphere and my right hemisphere and science and the world were all right in this unbelievable weird right of insight and it just i just then transformed my phenomenological experience was yeah. it was so clear to me okay and what mine what had happened in my body and i saw it i used to hide the diagram for the first couple of years i hid it and had oh. it over do not reproduce or or you know without permission yeah. i thought that if somebody like eo wilson so eo wilson produced the book called consilience the unity of knowledge in 1998 i think mm-hmm. one after and i was in the impression if he saw that he would immediately be able to see that this is the right formula. And so I was working on it for a year uh, without telling hardly anybody other than my family, um, yeah. private. And then I built it to a point where I was then ready to share it. I sent it to like Richard Dawkins, and E.O. Wilson, and Steve yeah. Baker, and Dan Dennett. Um, I got one word back from Dan Dennett, unsurprising. <laughs> uh-huh, right, right. And, uh, and so everybody just, you know, it was a total opposite reaction. I was, I was completely huh. convinced. Uh, that this was a totally transformational way of seeing it. Uh, yeah. They just shrugged it off. It was, it was not uh, seen as, as meaningful or novel or useful in any particular way. Well, what was that like for you? Uh, <laughs> right, hard. Okay. Yeah. yeah. At multiple levels, it was hard, uh, really, uh, and, and transformational. I, the, the thing that happened to my ego, and we can, you know, in terms of my own self, sense of self. Yeah. Um, that started in 1995 and really, I mean, it's an, we're, all of our egos are ongoing, but I had a 10 year period of dealing with this thing. Yeah. Um, because what yeah. you, I mean, I literally think I built 
a theory, not just of psychology, but of scientific knowledge. Yeah, yeah. That's really yeah. the tree of knowledge is scientific knowledge. Right. Well, if you think you built a theory of scientific knowledge writ large. <laughs> right, right. Solves the problems of the enlightenment and sets the stage for the 21st century knowledge. Right. To be right. Yeah. That's weird. I mean, you know, the guy next door. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right? Totally. Yeah, yeah. Okay? I mean, it's just an unusual belief to have. Right. <laughs> I have that belief, and I know what it's like to believe it, and it creates weird dynamics. Yeah. Right? Okay? Yeah. So, so, for example, my father's a history professor, you know, and uh -huh. he's fairly conservative and traditional, not in a democratic, I mean, in a political sense, but in a right. defers to the authority. Yeah. So, and, and he saw me, rightfully, in many ways, as not very bright. So there's always been an early, because my learning disability, and then I blossomed. Yeah. But yeah. the idea that his son would have done this, and he doesn't know what it is. And, you know, he's a history professor. And he's like, well, what do the experts say? Oh, and, God. Yeah. yeah. So my yeah. argument is, well, Dad, once the, once the experts see this thing, they will obviously have, it's so yeah. true that they will have to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I worked on it for a year and then we send it to the experts, you know, and actually kindly, he gave me a gift uh, for E.O. Wilson. He's, he offered E.O. Wilson a thousand dollars for an hour of his time so that I could show him the tree of knowledge, like in 1999. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So I sent it out to all these people in like 1999 or whatever, and just, you know, got an email back from Edward Wilson. Well, I'll see what it's in print. And I was like, well, we'll see. Right. Right. So everyone just, you know, said no. And, and right. I couldn't, any traction. I talked, I talked to the evolutionary psychology people. So no one cared. I mean, nobody saw it as anything meaningful. Um, right. So by 2000, then oh, I- Hang on with I just want to, like, I want to get that. Like, well, a couple of things. It's like, one, I, first of all, like, you know, I just want to acknowledge the sense I, I think what I'm hearing, right, mm -hmm. is that you're, so, so as you're talking, I can tell, I can tell like that, that this is, this is something you do with your whole being, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's like this, this, and, it, and I right. also, I can appreciate, you know, what you're talking about learning disabilities and stuff like I had a tons of them. I didn't even know I had any intellectual mm. anything oh, wow. until I yeah. was. So in, many kids I talked to a lot. I mean, yeah. some people that, you know, blossom late and have these capacities. It must be something the way we process information. Totally. Yeah, I think it is. Um, and, but that sense of like what I kind of, what I kind of can imagine, I just kept getting this picture of something was speaking to you. Right. And it's like, it's, it was beyond the horizon, but as you started moving towards it and it started shaping you, you started to discover it. Right. And, and this is one of the things, this is one of the mysteries to me. Right. Yep. That Completely. I'm, I'm fascinated with is like, how do we know to be, struck by something before we understand what's worthy of being struck by it right i and have then, no idea right that right. mystery Completely. is this place where things like philosophy and 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 it it, it becomes yeah. very trans rational in that way um completely but also deeply personal right so deeply just personal. deeply personal so just in the sense of just you know, writing it all down and then just having the wherewithal, being uh, keeping it really private, like, you know, and then putting it out and, oh my God, I'm just, just trying to imagine what that, <laughs> like, so my, No, I went, in, I went into therapy, you know, I had, and, and it was super interesting because I only, I only lasted 12, uh, I can't remember, something like 10, 10, 12 sessions and I didn't go into it at first, okay? Yeah. I had this therapist and he, and I left, two sessions, a session after a massive empathetic failure with my therapist on this issue, okay? Yeah. 1998, 1999. And yes, I'm glad, I, I feel known and valued by a guy, thank you, not surprising. Oh, yeah. you know, but people didn't get, I mean, you just didn't get what was happening to me over this right. two year period, and really a 10 year period before I actually came to terms and yeah. back to my dad and did all, all the work that needed to be done. Right. Um, but at this, I'm right in the middle of it, okay? And I have yeah. basically, sent it out a few times and gotten some feedback and people aren't having the reaction and it, because it's a mind fuck you know it's a complete mind fuck so you have no idea as to whether or not you're because you have your narcissistic urge yeah are you seeing this thing so clearly and no one else is seeing it, it doesn't make any sense and yeah. they can't convince people 
who should be able to be convinced why this is novel. I mean, at the, I now understand it's so much clearer, but back then it was a mystery. So I'm in therapy and I start talking, you know, and then by my sixth session, I really actually say to him, to my therapist, I was like, actually, you know, I basically said, I think that I'm like a Newton of psychology. Right. You know? right. My therapist says, you know, I, oh man, I totally get that. Blah, blah. When I was in high school, I thought I write, would write poetry like Robert Frost. That's what he said to me. Okay. Mm. I went back one more time, never told him exactly that, and then left, you know, but it's an empath, so, so I had empathetic failures sort of all around. People are not, if you say that I, you think you're a Newton, because everybody says that's a quack, so everybody assumes that you're just, a, you know, all right, I'll empathize, I'll pat you on the head, what the hell, you know, yeah. but when your phenomenology tells you to the cells of your being that this is true, okay, that what you're seeing is true, and you can see it, and no one else can tell you why you can't see it. They just tell you they don't see it. It's not like anyone could say, Greg, I understand your arguments. It was, Greg, that's unsurprised. Well, Dan Dennett, tell me why. Let me tell you exactly why this is radical, and I'll tell you why it's not unsurprised. Nope, no, no, I'm not doing that. So no one would tell you that they empathize. They just dismiss you. Right. Okay. And then you're like, you're stuck with it in your own head. You're trying to do whatever you can. Now I'm a, now it's not coming out of my locked box. And I'm like, I'm telling it to everybody. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, nope. You know, you're like, holy shit, you know? Wow. So, so yeah, it was really weird, you know? And it created all, it created some dynamics in my family, my significant other. Uh, uh -huh. I, I tell this story. She knows, my daughter knows this. So my wife and I, you know, we were dating since high school. But I had to go through this transformation. Yeah. Okay, to give you an idea of how poor it went to me. So um, she, she got pregnant with our first child. Uh, so that would have been, it would have been 1999. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I was, so I was two years into it and I was ready to go to a conference and, pre and present on it. Okay, and you know, it was flying and she was like seven months pregnant. Uh, we were driving me to the airport and we're like, oh my God, what if the plane goes down? You know, that comes up. My ideas. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah. Give you an idea what she's had to live with, right? Yeah. So she's a seven month pregnant with her husband going away and the idea of the plane going down. Now she knows what I'll be thinking about. Right. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it went like yeah. right down to the, like you actually yeah. kind of, in a certain sense, you, you're the very thing that you couldn't get anyone to really see, right? Which on some level, I, like to me, that kind of probably in a certain sense is being seen. Right. In that, in that, like, you know, that you're talking about something really deep when that, when people don't have the categories to understand it or comprehend it, yep. like, but yet you have, but you, but you're very, the very system that you've cut, you've created, like in a certain sense, perfectly explains, right? Like, right. that right. must Although be I, crazy just to it like, was, it was, well, I, had to, I had to work through that because it was, I yeah. did. I see that completely in retrospect now. I, and in fact, something like the Blue Church, you know, if you follow like Jordan Hall's work in terms of oh, yeah. the Blue Church, has such a wonderful articulation of the institutional inertia and infrastructure and logic justification system that now flows everything. And this is so transformative. It's like the digital from non digital. I mean, it really is. And the structure has no idea. So, what, and, and this was happening all the time. Individuals would see it, but there was no way that the system could digest it and be transformed by it. Yeah. Yeah. At the time. Yeah. Um, so in, and in retrospect, I see it, but as when I was 28 and 29 and, and had my dad inside me and wonder Rose, it was not easy. You know, it was definitely, right. it was that whole, you're alone and, and, and I'm very aware of that. And I'm also very aware the system tells me I'm a justifier, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, I want to be important, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know? So it's a, it was, you know, and then, so then I shifted like in 2000, I shifted strategy and started the writing. Then I was like, okay, I have to figure out how to write this thing, you know? Um, and had this image, like in 2001, of the joint points, and I was learning, I was getting behavioral investment theory. I had justification and the tree of knowledge and the influence matrix, although I didn't call it that at the time. But I didn't write have the life to mind point clarified. Yeah. Oh, okay, got you, yeah. I, I didn't have that clear, I didn't have the right language for that. And I was actually on a clinical science listserv. Yeah. Um, and there was a guy who I, in retrospect, I very appreciate, although I was in, you know, a lot of these justifying battles with him. Back in the days of the listserv, I'd get on there and I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. Right, 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 right. And he was an advocate of B.F. Skinner, okay? Yeah. So huge advocate of B.F. Skinner, and right. not 
hostile to cognition. And I, I have digested Skinner from the vantage point of a cognitist. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's interesting. But Skinner, he's got to be bullshit at some level. And yeah. I, I had him more to Watson and, 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 and like had some of the stereotypes. So then I engaged in this really deep conversation mm. with this guy. Mm. And then it was like, well, now I actually have to learn Skinner. <laughs> mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I opened up this book, it's called Selection of Consequences, okay? Uh, by, and it's basically his collected works of his best pieces. And one of the first page I opened, well, man is a function of three layers of selection. Yeah. You know, natural selection, behavioral selection, yeah and selection right and it is these three layers that determine the human behavioral process unfold right it's like right holy shit that's life mind and culture right <laughs> right totally yeah yeah okay? yeah i was like skinner's look at skinner's whole three-tier selection system is my life emerging out of matter mind emerging out of culture and cult you know it's like i mean culture of mind coming out of life and, and culture coming out of mind his verbal selection lines up with justification. His operant theory lines up with mind and yeah. his um, and recognition of evolutionary theory. Huh. So then it was like, oh my God. And then I got more and clear about why, what his philosophy was and how he totally, you know, his philosophy of behaviorism. Mm. And so that was like in 2000 and with that piece. So then I was like, and then I collapsed that into what called behavioral investment theory. And I saw how the system assimilated and integrated Skinner yeah. and the cognitive growth uh, science functionalist of view. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So then I, that was my first paper. Then, then I had, I could use the tree of knowledge to show how we could go to physics, to biology, relatively well organized and then you get chaos. Right. And then you, and then in American psychology, at least you can then say two most influential people are Skinner and Freud. Once you consider how diametrically opposed they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then psychology, are you going to be a behaviorist like Skinner or an analyst like Freud? And those yeah. are, Super influential, but they're diametrically opposed. Yeah. Right? Well, then I was like, I can take Skinner and link him here. So yeah. Life to mind, and I take Freud and put him here. Right. I have life, mind, culture on a biopsychosocial. Boom. Right. Now right. we have now the whole thing comes on. Totally. totally. And in the middle is this cognitive developmental view, got a Piaget and all this yeah. other. Taking the extremes, put them in and aligned in a Wilsonian consilience picture yeah. knowledge of the whole. Okay. Right. So, uh, and, and that's a damn good paper. I, you know, and I got that yeah. book, review of general psychology. And that was the other time when I was like, okay, yeah. now when review of general psychology is the APA first journal, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's a reason it's not, right. it's not a super high journal. It was very good journal, you know, and I was like, well, this is going to get me leverage. And it did a little bit. I got following that. I got some recognition. I got two special issues. I ended mm. up getting a job at the journal oh. at mm. MU actually is this very interesting uh, place that actually was interested in theory. So I went to the job market. Okay? Yeah. And everywhere I've been working with actually Aaron Beck. I got a job with Aaron Beck for four years and worked as his right hand man at the University of Pennsylvania. Right. Aaron Beck, who's Aaron Beck? Oh, Tim Be Beck of like father of cognitive therapy. Have heard of Okay, cognitive? yes. Oh, yeah. Not, okay. okay. I, knew, I knew the so, name. Yeah, cognitive therapy. Yeah. So, so anyway, you sometimes go by, no, the guy, the father of the most oh. famous actually living. Uh, okay. Psychiatrist, technically, but in terms of influence in psychology. So I was at the University of Pennsylvania working for four years under him huh. um, while I was doing this. So, uh, you know, I was in the midst of, and I could have followed his line. And he actually hired me with excitement about my theory, but then he wouldn't listen to it after I got there. Oh, <laughs> I was, okay. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> he's right, still, right. He's still, he's still hanging around, although he's like right. a bastard now. Um, so, anyway, so then I was ready to get a job. And I, everywhere I went, I, had to t I talked about our suicide. Uh, study or empirical study on suicide attempters that I ran. That was my day job while I was running the theory. So that's a whole nother side of this. Is talk about bottom of the barrel uh, in terms of life ecology. These are suicide attempters from inner city Philadelphia. Really, really tough population. Yeah. That was my day job working for Beck. Um, right. And I got a lot to say about that at that reality. But um, So then I published this and I had some stature because I was at the University of Pennsylvania and I got that. Um, and there was some interest and I got two special issues. I got my job and I got two special issues mm -hmm. in clinical psychology and had a few conferences and there was some momentum in the mid 2000s. Okay? Right. Um, there was interest and people commented on it and I thought that we might get, but then the, this is when I ran into the institutional problem. Everybody had so many different reactions to it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I love this piece, but I don't like this piece. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how to apply it. I don't know how to speak the whole language. So everybody sees it from all of these different angles. Yeah. 
okay? Right. It can't, it, as such, it couldn't leverage the institution at all. It just would dissipate because everybody's experiencing different parts of it. Yeah, yeah. It couldn't get coordinated around it. Right, right, right. Um, and, and, and I was operating from a top-down basic, hey, I have truth, here's the truth, see the arguments, digest yeah. And then go off and you know I win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in right. the academic day, that was the you know that was the game I thought we were playing. Yeah. So yeah. that was the and and then after that it sort of fizzled and I started to reboot my um, self. I became director of this doctoral program at JMU, which is fascinating. Mm-hmm. Combined, integrated, uh, produces psychological doctors, so clinicians uh-huh. and its founders um, are were focused on an integrative theory. Mm. And, Brought me in, and when I gave my job talk in 2003, all the others were empirical, supported, you know, all the data from our study. How would I get a grant? How would I run re- research studies? Mm-hmm. When I to JMU, they were like, tell us about your theory. Yeah. It was oh, amazing. Okay. Yeah. So I had a job talk with no data, you know, uh-huh. all on ideas, which is unbelievably unheard of at the level of right. psychology, right? Right. And job, and I went, I called my dissertation advisors because he was a, um, a behaviorist, uh, lovely. Yeah. But a crusty old behaviorist, uh, right, right, Lightenberg, and he was like, he would be like, "You're never gonna get a theory, a job doing theory." And I got to call Harold and said, "I got a job. My theory got me hired." <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so that was a joy to my, my academic fathers. I got to say, "Hey, you know, I did that." Yeah, totally, totally. So, uh, and then I basically hunkered down for twelve years. I was building this program and direct it became director of it in two thousand five. Right. Came the expression of my soul basically was inside the program. Okay. Yeah, right. Can I direct the pro, you know, I was already the institution, but this little microcosm, and I think yeah. they did a good job of it, you know, for I think the program actually is a, uh, led up to a lot of the ideals and crafted the professional identity, uh, very much around this combined, integrated, and this unified frame played a very, you know, I was director, so it had it. Right. You know. So you were able to like, you were, you were able to like, ta- like like literally do almost like a, a little bit of an empirical test of, uh, of the- uh, more, exactly a whole really a life practice test you know yeah. so here is the here's you want to do i mean i'm always about what's called ecological validity that's a, that gets underemphasized by the empirics and experiment yeah. does it actually work and what it consequence does it have in the real world right you know, ecology put it in the ecology and see what the hell happens right because it's a complex dynamic system that you can't predict so you got to drop it in there so yeah you know that was uh that was part of the test and you know you spoke to it's my life so my my home life my my family and my children my you know you see it on the back of the garden my job it was just you know once this thing hit into my cells it just you know it just became you know all of me right Wow, I just kind of getting an experience of that, just, you know, all <laughs> of get, having that opportunity mm. to watch this in other people and in the system and in a program that like, and I was, I was so, I was so happy. So many different levels you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're going out and receiving in that. Like, it's just really, right. what a beautiful opportunity to really. It, I was so thankful to find a place that actually yeah. could just, you know, it, the academic psychology uh, is really academic psychology is just basically empiricist. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The practice domains are either dominated by empiricism or, uh, you know, very few academic systems were set up. Yeah. Really embraced me. So I was very, very fortunate to come back to JMU. Right. Uh, it was a, it was a really, it was a good run as the director. I stepped down voluntarily for the director and started to explore. Um, right. Uh, and actually, it's been a little bumpy because outside the role of director and what's happened, uh, my relationship with the program actually went through some uh, less than ideal uh, experience mm-hmm. after I stepped off. Um, mm-hmm. There was, I got into some clashes with uh, systems that were, uh, from a political vantage point, uh, I got polarized a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, not getting into details, but was sort of had some white male dynamics. Right. <laughs> Imagine, okay, was right. seen, uh, experienced uh, movements that were so strongly progressive uh, yeah. to be um, sort of intense and push back. Actually, Jordan Peterson. So Jordan Peterson plays yeah. a role in this uh, because yeah. um, I had heard bad things about him. I wasn't really, uh, you know, through some of the left mm-hmm. kind of films. And then I looked into him and I was like, yeah. oh my God, you know, this guy's yeah. he's a really serious academic. 
you know, yeah. from my vantage yeah. point. Yeah. And while his rhetoric is uh, more polarizing than the rhetoric that I would want to have, I was under the impression, and firmly to this day believe, that the mature psychological position is to take him very seriously yeah. uh, and to appreciate what he represents culturally as yeah. psychologists. In fact, that's our right. obligation. Um, right. Any simplistic narrative about what he is from either side, uh, yeah. either just a fanboy narrative that he's, you know, brilliant and perfect, or a, oh my God, he's a complete transphobe and I can't believe anybody listens to him or anything like that. Right. So both those are just, so I was actually bringing him in to say we should study him yeah. and we should listen to him well giving him attention for some you know and, and, and automatically him, made you something yeah now i was on the right now i was and that's so by where i was like this is a great academic opportunity for us to dialogue and then to be pushed back and then i pushed back and that's when uh yeah. so it got, you know because people got pushed a little bit um mm. and that's what's launched me into then into the intellectual dark web and the rebel wisdom crowd huh. yeah. uh and and yeah, so it was 2018. Uh, and then I went to huh. Alexander Bard as an intellectual deep web. I went to that. Um, huh. And metamodernism. Then I went into the metamodernism world. Right. Uh, and that's where I hooked up with John Verveke. And it was in that context I saw, you know, the circling world. And, yeah. And just jumped out of academia. I realized uh, that for, to me, in retrospect, the what I now have my language is, is that. The, the, the academic psychology is basically a modernist empiricist system. Mm -hmm. Okay. The practice of psychology is a postmodern sort of diversity multicultural system. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm a meta modernist basically. And, and you know, right. an inner meta modernist kind of thinker. And yeah. You know, including and transcending. Yeah. Okay. And I was bumping my head up against sensibilities, you know, that were institutionally organized yeah. different sensibilities. Yeah. And then, get into the leading edge of culture world of, of the John Verbeke and meta modern, you know, that's been really freeing and feeling, uh, just feeling much more at home. Yeah, totally. And so like what you're doing now, are you, do you have a teaching position or like, what's the, yeah, no, I'm a full professor. So the nice thing is you have a full professor and you know, yeah, <laughs> right. obligations, right. Um, but I d devoted so much service and, and all of that. I have, you know, yeah. I have reasonable teaching load. And so, yeah my scholarship and, and I've sort of like, I'm writing a book, uh, my next updated book, um, but I'm, I'm not interested in trying to go to the conferences or publish in mainstream yeah. journal or yeah. get the people that have the power, get to Steve Pinkers of the world to right. pay attention and, and do right. all, although Steve Pinker now is actually <laughs> given that he got sucked into some of the um, Jordan Peterson stuff. But um, yeah. you know, the, in other words, I'm no longer trying to bang my head up against the institution. And, yeah. I'm basically like, actually, my world is the leading edge of culture. It's, it's that metamodern yeah. world right? Right. Um, where people totally. realize, people realize totally. the institutional infrastructures of the blue church of yeah. the 20th century yeah. are not going to be up to the speed of right. the century. And to the extent that they are, we're going to drive off a cliff, as like Daniel Schmachtenberger and some of those folks tell us very, you know, yeah. the system, the capitalistic system that we did was brilliant and elevating us. Okay. Yeah turning mother nature into a human technology in a right. very, very dangerous way. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what, so I was, I'm curious now, like, what's it like kind of coming out of, ac like out of academia and talking about your work, like here with John on YouTube yeah. at the STOA, like, what's that? Like, what's it's been, been like, been <laughs> it's been you know, it's been wonderful. It's to sit with people and actually, rather than try to make the case academically and in yeah. and in conference, I tell you, you know, the academic structure, especially if it's sensibilities not arranged. Yeah. So you have a presentation in the academic structure, everyone's like, "Well, what about? Have you read this?" And you know, yeah. just, and I and usually the answer is now, yeah, actually, right, <laughs> right, right, totally. But but the culture, this culture, okay. So the kairos of the moment. All right, so. Yeah. It's in, in this cultures, everyone already says, oh, well, the blue church is not up to speed. So the schema are, are hunting for sense-making systems. In this yeah. You yeah. Know? And, and the sensibilities of the people that got here, that, you know, that found themselves in this culture right. are built in this particular sort of meta-modern sensibility way. Right. So we're all sort of looking. And the, I mean, this tree of knowledge thing is weird. So if you, if you pay attention to the tree of knowledge, 
Yeah. As soon as when I built the tree of knowledge, within six weeks, I knew that I knew the 21st century was going to be really intense. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. After yeah. I built it. Okay. Right. Why? Yeah. Well, how come? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, if you understand the structure, so you get the emergence out of energy comes matter, mm-hmm. which is complicated stuff. Okay? Yeah. And then in the line of life, what happens is the emergence of a complexity building feedback loop that builds complex adaptive systems like right. cells. Okay. Right. Well, cells are these self-organizing complex adaptive systems that yeah. have information storage, yeah. computation and processing inside the cell, and yeah. then network communication between cells. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's that coordinated functional flow of information right. that sustains the life dimension of complexity. <clears throat> right, 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 okay? right. All right. So then that's why it's a qualitatively different dimension. Yeah. That's why it's a different cone. Right. Okay? And the change from life from chemistry to biology is fundamentally different than just physics yeah. to chemistry. Physics yeah. To chemistry is a, is a jump. It's yeah. not this is a qualitative jump. Okay? Right. And then you then you go for three billion years and you do in the next jump through the Cambrian explosion and you get to mind and mm. you because now you get brains pulling cells together. Yeah. To create a whole coordinated body. Right. Okay? Right. All right. So now right. you get an animal that's like a cell and right. the brain is like the nerve is like the DNA. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay? And then you got an information processing and animal to animal communication that gives rise to that in yeah. a mental dimension. Right. Okay. Right. So then you get language, okay, which is symbolic information processing in here and communication between people. Mm-hmm. Right. Locking, linking up our minds. Right. Okay. Right. 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 So then you get to jump up into culture. Yeah. So every one of these dimensions of complexity is tied together by a novel information processing system networked together through a new communication system. Yeah, 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 right, right. Okay, now what did we do in the 20th century? We built computers, right. compute electronic information, yeah. the internet that had started to network it all together. Yeah, right. And we're starting to information interface with them. There's an internet of things and we're building shit inside of our head that blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Those artificial big data computer systems and. Right. Boom. The next dimension of complexity on the doorstep. Yeah. Right. Right. And it's getting fat. Like each, is it, is it fair to say each is getting faster and faster and faster, right? The first one took 10 billion years to go. Right bang to life right okay. then yeah. it was like three billion years to yeah. go from life to mind yeah right? then it was like 700 million years to get to culture then it's been a hundred thousand years all right yeah now, 50 years and now we're just on a hundred year right. horizon here right okay. <laughs> right yeah. totally. holy shit and you're right on the doorstep so it's like we were so what this so what this showed me is like remember, jellyfish had, were existed right before the cambrian explosion they had all these distributed neural nets mm. but brains and organized body systems mm. and explosion happens and boom you get co- brains and complex bodies and then the thing mind emerges yeah 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 so we have a distributed neural networks a system equipment right. with computers and then the internet we're laying down the nervous system right have a brain yet yeah <laughs> right, right. right? Totally. so it's like the 21st century is going to see the beginning of the brain that's going to launch us into the metacultural dimension this yeah the world okay yeah what do you like do you have a sense of like when you imagine what that starts to look like and the kinds of things that start to happen mm-hmm. like i can't i can't imagine you have not like <laughs> right like that's the well, that's the, like, that's, the, that's the event horizon that you yeah. now, once you learn to speak the tree of knowledge language, you now set, I often talk about riding the wave. Yeah. So riding the wave means you're on the cusp of the present. Yeah. Recognizing that you're this unfolding wave of probability. Right. Okay. Right. Look out at the wave of possibility. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that's what, and now you're sitting at this cusp of interface. Right. Okay? And that's what. That's what I knew would be coming down the road. Now, I didn't know when. And, and, right. you know, and when I actually then started to jump out of culture, out of my academic culture and into the new wave culture, okay, right. and heard Jordan Hall and Daniel Smachtenberger and all these people talking about game B, 
Yeah. Right. And the dangers, then I realized that the old system was getting outpaced by the digital so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? yeah. yeah. That actually the teetering of the top. And by the way, every one time you go through these, it's dangerous. All yeah. right. Yeah. Because the, the right amount of complexity has to happen. Right. You get all together at the right amount, or else you get chaos on the one hand or hyper order on the other that locks it down. Yeah. And have a complex adaptive dialectic between order and chaos. So it's right. actually the very, that's a fifth point point is threading a needle. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thought that was coming later, but man, once I jumped out and looked around at the structure of the world, I was like, oh my God, we might be right on the cusp of it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. You know? And then I read into, uh, there's this unbelievable paper, at least for me, at the level of magical. You talk about the spiritual leading edge. There's a, there's a you know, the singularity from. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The event which he posted in 1945. Right. Well, there's a Russian theorist, okay, who argued that Kurzweil's math was wrong. There's a whole other layer of exponential acceleration. Mm. Okay. And what he does is he finds an entirely different data set on the curve of complexity from Russian theory that mm. emphasizes it, that has different events, okay, that are happening. Yeah. So you have two totally different events, okay, of complexity, Russian uh, inventions and developments and discoveries and mm -hmm. Western. Yeah. Well, these lines on this, on his new um, ex cross, okay, huh. The singularity, which is the ultimate limit function of the exponential, if you follow the rate. Yeah, yeah. They ha he's got regression lines on the one hand, it's like 0.994, okay? Yeah. And on the other, regression's a 0.996. Right. One line crosses the singularity in 2029, and the other in 2027. Yeah. It's not yeah. unbelievable, okay? Right. So, so there is this com uh, complexity regression line that mm -hmm. crosses is it from Russian data points and United States data points it crosses at around 2028 20, all right that's like crosshairs yeah that would basically point to the center of the fifth fucking joint point oh my god wow that's eight years away right right <laughs> okay right so talk about cosmic coordinates man it's a, yeah it's like whoa okay yeah such a trip that's such that's a trip, a trip man that is it. When I saw that, and then I learned about the singularity, and then I learned about that singularity, whew, and that's the digital social techno point, okay, of yeah. complex adaptive observation distributed. Right. And ultimately, that's the brain that will then emerge in the 21st century. Yeah, yeah. And do you have any sense of what that's going to look like? Do you have any, does your well, imagination I mean, go and, into, into that, that world at all? My... Yes, uh, although I was, the first thing uh, I learned a new word a little while ago by uh, Stuart Kaufman. He, uh, I was reading a book by him called The Unprestatable Future. Okay, so I love uh, the yeah. things are so unbelievably, God only knows, so you're an unprestatable. Mm -hmm. uh, but the principles, definitely principles. So I love the principle of the thing has whatever it's, if it's going to grow, it has to go between the, or, uh, the dialectic of order and chaos. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, the, the principle of complex adaptation is going to be found there. Right. right. And when you identify that chaos, you can then say, well, what are they? There are a lot of chaotic parameters that would be nightmarish. Obviously, a, a nuclear work law, or, or we can have a, a, an internet electronic event like a pulse from a sun, and we'll actually fry the whole thing. Entropy will pull the whole thing down really easy. Yeah. The entire yeah. stack, we can, we can kill ourselves in a heartbeat. There's no law that says it has to happen. Okay. Right. It's on the knife edge of ordering complexity to build the negentropic increase. Okay? Yeah. So we yeah. very so, they, so yeah. So there's the chaos side. The thing can crash and burn. Right. right? There's right. It's too much instability. There's too much change. The order structures that are organizing the flow of resources and energy break down, and we fall in trouble. And I see that as a real possibility. In fact, over the last two years, my my family was getting sick and tired. And they're like, actually, global civilization collapse. Yeah. <laughs> real thing. My family. Yeah. Jesus, you know. And now, of course, we're like, well, actually, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Maybe crazy yeah. Greg isn't so crazy after all. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> so, right. so anyway, you know, you, you have the chaos side, and then you have the horror of the order side. Okay, so the yeah. order side is when you have the opportunity for sake, the opportunity, like for 1984. Yeah. You know, uh, when 1984 was uh, the, the, you know, when I first read that, I was like how the hell do you do that? You know, how do you um, go back and control all the information? 
you know, when things written in print. Yeah. You know, that would be a mechanical trouble to be able right. to really have to have physical control. If you have the internet. Yeah. If, you, if you're the center of control of the internet, then you can have a governmental control of everything. You right. censor everything. You create any virtual video you want. Yeah. We're not that far away from having an undetectable virtual video. So if you're a dissident, boom, just create a video. And right. we will be locked in, you know, be like our own little matrix nightmare, right. the movie. Right. Okay. Right. So, so that's the terror is, is, is the idea that somebody, some brain is going to then use us as manipulative little neurons. Okay. That yeah. then are complete pawns that lack all free will. Right. We either right. blow it up or get absolutely controlled. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. So, so how the hell do we ask? Oh God. I said, well, that's the scary thing. I thought we'd have till 2050. Now it's like, you yeah. know, quick. Everybody yeah. all hands on deck. The Titanic needs to change, and you have a quarter of a mile, and yeah. the Titanic needs to change. Yeah. So God, yeah. What, somebody, the, the 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 there's a there's a uh, organization called Miri here in 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 the Bay Area. That's where I live. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're they're basically they've been worrying. They just basically have like some of the smartest people, like some of the most socially awkward. <laughs> Well, yeah. they, there like, tends to be a, you know. like totally like um but but in the in and he he took he actually took my my circling course um and okay. they all they do is they think about they they worry about ai right and yep. they're all right. and, and and it's interesting because the level of the level of intelligence right and the level of thinking that to even be able to perceive that they're like it's just, it's just crazy. And he is like, you know, um, the, 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 the owner of this, he, you ask him how he's doing and it's based on where all this is at. Right. Cause he really does feel they're on the side of, you know, this thing turns and it's, there's, we just don't have any say so. And so he's like, right. they're anticipating, well, how do you do it? Maybe you invent it first and you put and you test it. But I think that one of the things about this is just fascinating to me is one, one it, like when my imagination goes into that event horizon, right? Yeah. Like, and is, is that there's this way about, about the more technological things get, the, the faster they disappear, right? Yeah. And, and people don't realize that, that it's like, that when you get up and you look at your phone, that's the first thing you like, literally we think conceptually inside of our calendar right like yes it becomes totally. and, and then we if we start to think with it and mm -hmm. we don't notice it by definition it, it disappears right yes whereas before right. it'd be like most of the time you know you would like first of all you're in a role that was given to you from of and then most of the things around you like you either made or you knew how to fix and it had everything had this more of this kind of you know like it, it, it had more resistance. Yeah. Now, there's like less and less resistance between things, but it's got this connection with disappearing. So it makes yeah. it makes sense to me that like we would, if something like the horizon event horizon line were crossed, I doubt we'd even notice it. Like right, right. I mean, it's not like I mean, you know, the, the, as somebody says, oh, the sky tur turns purple, and all of a sudden, it's it's something, and they don't. Many people don't know exactly what they're in at least we're talking about singularity event horizons. Yeah. The theory of knowledge gives you an idea. And basically what it is, is there is a, what people have matched, mapped is the evolution of complexity in a particular way out of a right. line. And yeah. that's going to transform. Right. And then there'll be another operative chance. Yeah. Uh, so there will be, and then basically that line hits its limit. And then there's another line on the right. other side. Right? Yeah. So that, and then where that is and how long. Mm -hmm. Friends, I mean, yeah, the, the, it's the artificial intelligence that is the computational infrastructure yeah. okay, of this meta dimension. That's right. Okay. right. And then it's the inner, our interface with it. Is, mm -hmm. And then a whole, our whole issue is we have to have a wise interface with it. Right. right? Yeah. Wise interface. Which is not something I'm seeing. No, that's right. the error. And that's what the that's what I'm trying to get out there is and the reason is of course what we did was was STEM STEM is science math and technology it's all those hyper autistic spectrum folks yeah. who 
unbelievably good at the analytic justification, and that's all that there is, and build technology that enables that to be realized. Right. The courtroom and courtyard and the human relating piece. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And that's you know? that's where all of the morality happens. That's, that's where right. The, it's that's funny. Right. It's like it does seem like it does seem like like human I thou. It's the one thing that you can't optimize, right? Like it actually, it's, it's this place where you can't collapse distances. I don't know, uh, it's actually, it's in confronting your, your otherness, right? That, mm -hmm. that I, you have to go through something to, to, to feel the mystery of you, right? Amen. And that sense Amen. of fullness. Yeah. So, so the, Human so I, if we can create a digital culture that honors the levels beneath it, yeah. Okay. That's what wisdom is, you know, yeah. and then it will create a stable honoring yeah. sustainable yeah. values. Right. Okay. And the danger is, is that if this thing is constructed without being anchored, it will tear off, become a God on its own or right. multiplicity of gods. And we will have created by children who don't understand yeah. the wisdom of the gods. Right. right? And then, you know, then right. you've got the order chaos, hell, you know, yeah. that's, thing will then rain upon us yeah right and so this is like one of the ways that for me I, i've thought about what's happening right like right mm -hmm. um with this like this conversation mm -hmm. yeah. is one of the few places that i that i can see that where technology has brought forth something that is fundamentally not technological and made it more available right, right. like like so so for example all of the all the people that you're talking about the intellectual dark web right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's interesting because i don't know how these people would have found each other otherwise no right? no this is the potential this is the yeah. opportunity. this system gives us so many look at yeah. this i mean you yeah. know i can call you up boom right. collapse space time yeah. have a real experience of your humanity right. Right. right away and i'll just hit see ya you know and then i'll go and my thing and we'll have had this wonderful connection yeah, yeah. and then you put it up and have it as examples or whatever man it's yeah. unbelievable okay right, right. Um, so that's what we need to figure out how to cultivate yeah and the question is so for me what what we're looking at i have defined thomas Bjorkman talks about meta crises okay the leader in the emerge thing and i characterize them as follows so there's the digital globalization meta crisis is that mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what's changing everything. So the blue church is totally archaic. And then what are we going to evolve into? And is that going to topple us or are we going to grow? Mm -hmm. We have the techno environmental crisis, which is the way we're chewing up the earth. Yeah. You know, seven, you know, plus billion of us that are pulling the technology out. And how the hell are we going to manage that without yeah. serious damage? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And those are, so those are major structural issues. But then we have the human problems of meaning mental health crises. Yeah. Okay. So, so what we need, I love that you have Raphael behind you. Right. Okay. Yeah. So what we need, and this is what, from this is where I really come into the equation and trying to, we need an enlightenment 2.0 quickly yeah. Okay, yeah. that reboots the academy yeah. and roots our socio-political court right. regard. Right. Leading. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that as this thing grows, we all are not, right. we're, know what we need as human beings right totally and then we can start to see you know it's one of the things that's been interesting for me in starting to get um because because we started circling and i got into heidegger and it, i've been kind of the one that's been the the like working out the what's going on <laughs> here and mapping it out and yep, yep, the yep. distinctions and stuff um but pretty much like I, for the most part, I really hadn't had much, many people to talk to at this level, mm, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so when I started this podcast, it was just like, well, I thought it'd be just like interesting to have a podcast and have people on, interested people on, and then do something like an interview or like a circle. But then I started like actually talking to people that have actually read some of the same books I've read and right. have all this rigor around it. And it is blossomed into this whole other thing that I'm still inside of going on this ride <laughs> yeah right it's, it's really quite ecstatic but yes. uh, but I, one of the things i've noticed is that you know it's it's like for example this is in a it's like with you like see like seeing you 
right, in a very real way, is really seeing your ideas and is seeing the being, right, that's called forth in those ideas, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, yeah. it's, uh, is that there's people, it seems like the people that are, are, can start to address these problems, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's a whole world of people like that, that, that are just, that's different, right. And, right. And this is, and yeah. this is, it's, it's figuring out that network and distributing it and then, and making sure that we stay as connected with as many people as possible. Don't yeah. become isolated. Yeah, right? totally. Distribute the attentional systems in yeah. a circling sort of way into yeah. our communities, yeah. our, the systems, is, you know, that's yeah. that. because, and I do believe that people, it's because I think certainly for myself, you know, to find your way here means that you have, have to have something inside of you where you see the convention. You know, yeah. it, the simple path is follow a convention. You know, yeah. I, I work with Beck, you know, he's already established, you know, I could have done his stuff and then done his stuff and then done his stuff, yeah. and yeah. that stuff because that, you know, the, the line of institutional status, right? Yeah. But then when I would have been 40 and you would have asked me, you know, how great is cognitive therapy? Oh, great, therapy is great. And, you know, my heart would have basically, that's because my father Beck is telling me how great it is. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because I internalize yeah. the institution and I'm right. playing it out. Well, right. those of us that are post-conventional, you know, yeah. outside the convention are finding our way here, we're, we're being led by something else. Right, right. And that thing, and that's that thing I've noticed that I was talking with John, like a number of other people the other day about like, you know, one of the biggest things that people talk about in circling that's so, so life changing for them is this experience of what they call being seen, right? Being deeply <laughs> seen is this thing that is it, it's not obvious actually what that is, right? And I, no. I, well, I it's not, yeah. it's not, I think what I think, and this is what I think really listening to somebody is, there's right. something to do with, it's not when I, it's not when I understand what you understand about yourself, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's, more like, it's more like you have the experience of being seen when, when somehow I can kind of hear the thing that's beyond the horizon that's been, that you're, it's so background for you that you've been in response to, and we can start to articulate that. That's the moment, right? Yes. Where it's actually, it's a trend, it's like, Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. right. Well, that what that what I would say that that happens. So you know, as a clinician, yeah. you try to do this in, in other kinds of scenarios. When when you get that moment, when you experience it, when you, you're able to give it to somebody else, yeah, right? yeah, you're seeing the true self event horizon. Yeah. Okay. You know, in other words, you're seeing inside of that person a particular aspect of their personhood yeah. that they may have intuited, but even yeah. their narrative couldn't see or was, yeah. you know. But it's like you sense that potential, and then you you know mirror it. Right. And then you validate it through the your seeing right. their knowing and value that aspect of them. Yeah, you bring it into being through you, and then they feel it, but you know, right. them into them. Yeah, you know, it's a whole organizing structure. Totally, yeah. and it's so it happens. To, it's interesting. It's like it's like yeah, me seeing you, but it's really like we're seeing you mm -hmm. beyond you. Mm -hmm. but constituting you and that becomes a light uh, for me that's like the experience it's like i do i go through this i, I walk out changed after that like oh god right, right? I mean, because and to me that's like the vision of the third other it's this idea of the i talk a lot about the concept of god you know yeah. this idea of a loving agape that as we the mutual relational value that's experienced then yeah. then just moves into the social field yeah same, you know and, right you know, it's the cumulative iterative process of that jumps it up on the one hand, or when shit happens, you know, when you see a polarized hell scenario, yeah. it's like it just tears it all down and you just feel the disgust right. of, of the tension and the reverse. Yeah. Everybody's, it's more than the negative exchange. It's negative through everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Or the reverse when it's, it's cumulative and then through everybody. So it's just this elevation. Right. Totally. Yeah. Because there's a kind of there's also this level of like, and this is where I think in what we've been talking about with dialogos, where it's like having that kind of intimacy going on, right? Mm -hmm. But where actually you move into like a metacognitive, right? Right. Where where on some level you start to like that that you start to how do you put this? It's like you start to feel into and direct almost like it's almost like touching into the logos directly right, on some level, where you have these moments where everything starts to look 
you realize the thing that's mm-hmm. been having the conversation the whole time, that that which mm-hmm. is already the case, mm-hmm. that sense of kind of like, <laughs> where everything's yeah. fractal inside, and, and right. there's that kind of right. aesthetic well, that, right. of the, the gathering the, the, and the lighting. The crescendo, the, you know, and right. all of a sudden, right, it comes to, right, yeah. the fractal up and the whole thing, the light shines. Yeah. Oh, that's, and that, that, and then walking. That feels through, spiritual, right? Totally. And like the neurology and the, uh-huh. all the things that you're enacting in having those conversations and the flow spaces. And also, and here's the important part, is like, it matters whether or not you're looking at reality, right? And that you're, and you're aware that you don't know whether or not you're looking at reality and that you're looking at, you're looking at re- what's real and that that's the feedback loop, right? That's the thing that is more well, that's, that, clear. That our our, our vulnerability, thing, right? yes. Well, this is, we have to be very, uh, what is a cult basically, but a cult is something that tr- essentially yeah. insists on that ideology and then has practices that get people into the ritual of the ideology, which right. will then give an experiential system. But yeah. man, if that correspond to reality, you right. know, <laughs> luck, right? You're gonna go off a cliff. Right. Uh, so uh, yeah, as I'm a scientist at heart, you don't have to, you know, yeah. the, the, anchor point better be you know uh, yeah. and that's the beauty of where we do an enlightenment 2.0 in my point is there's actually we have the knowledge now okay to layer the structure so we go all the way down to the quantum yeah all right? yeah and then back to big bang and all the way up yeah into us and above right. you know and concept of god right you know and future singularity and all of these concepts yeah. you know about how we might be able to realize right. you know what's relevant in the 21st century right now right so great talking to you so (laughs) so great talking with you yeah Uh, i really appreciate i really appreciate our conversation i have to i have to get going now yep that's we've been going for maybe i think two and a half hours yeah yeah. (laughs) it's time flies yeah how is this how is this for you great man i really appreciate i i had a sense uh you know um listening to you so yeah circling uh, rocks man <laughs> right. i really appreciate the uh um the opportunity uh, and to share and uh yeah i really think that we're you know like i said 20 years ago or whatever it's like hey you know now we're getting to the cusp and the kairos of the moment and we got to network folks together um i often use sort of a close encounters of the third kind i don't know if you know that uh, movie but this people see the mountain you know right. I think folks are starting to see the mountain and right. weave them together and and distribute it with wisdom right. well, then then the evolution through the fifth joint point happens right yeah. right on let's and let's make let's let's make your work more more let's get it out there wonderful i really appreciate the opportunity so yeah much love okay bye-bye take care